thank you all for waiting. It's really my great pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, it's our second conference uh, under the title of Beyond the Gaming Principle. Maybe we'll finally realize what does it mean. And uh, this time we uh, convene under the subtitle, let's say, our crisis. Maybe we'll discover today what game games actually represent in terms of uh, current crises. Um, I need to actually uh, do some official thanks. I think it, we have been supported by the Academy of Fine Arts, where we are. We have been supported also by the PhD lab of, of this academy. And we don't we don't really know whether we will, we have been supported by the Ministry of Culture, but uh, we have their logo. yeah, we have their logo. And just for the sake of it, and make a, make ourselves sure, we, we also thank the Ministry of Culture of Czech Republic. <laughs> we, we, we are making culture of the Czech Republic. Yeah. Uh, so that's thank you so much. Václav have given me the mic, so it means I have to. Or it is my great pleasure to kind of tell you what will be going on today and we will be kicking off slightly late with Laura Obdebeke and Katarzyna Kovandova in the first blog that will be very much about climate crisis, climate crises maybe, because Frostpunk is a different kind of crisis than uh, our, uh, our warming one. Uh, then we will have our keynote, another keynote by Alfie Baum, uh, which will be complemented by the presentation by Bidwohal. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the, the keynote of Alfie will be about the intersection of leftist politics and play, if I remember it correctly. Do I? Cool. And then we will end this uh, block of presentations and talks by Total Refusal, uh, a pseudo Marxist guerrilla, which will present their work uh, at the intersection of uh, so called moving image, which is uh, a term from art I really like, and games. Uh, and ideological critique through those means. And then our humble uh, collective position paper we finished yesterday. And then there will be a collective discussion and also an after party for which we welcome you all. And we have uh, reserved the table at the nearby craft beer like a uh, uh, bar. Uh, so you're free to join us. And I will give. Uh, the voice to Victor for the bi program. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Andre, and uh, welcome everyone. So uh, I'm uh, taking care for bi program for tomorrow, and uh, it starts on the uh, second building of Academy of Fine Arts. It's on the building besides the main building, it's, it's, which is uh, actually a building of architecture architecture studies uh, but there is also digital laboratory and other two rooms so uh, everything is signed so hopefully it's 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 not a kind of a dungeon for you and uh, maybe later on it will be the escape escape game uh, but uh, let's see um yeah so i'm just uh, creating uh, from my from my also perspective and position of um, uh, uh, researching the transformation of uh, phonic language in the in the immersive uh, uh, um, technologies and experiences. Uh, so I've got something which are a little little bit uh, fall out of the frame of kind of gaming. But uh, at the end, uh, last uh, last last guest is the uh, winner of the uh, Sarupetsky Prize, which is actually uh, uh, which is actually. Uh, which will actually present the, the, his uh, computer game, which is, uh, which is about three-channel immersive uh, situation and kind of situation of uh, uh, communication with the other players, which are players. What Victor means is a VR zone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so I can start from the, from the beginning again. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's on the program, this VR session and talks. And we've got uh, interesting uh, uh, guests. Uh, there is uh, Barbara, um, Barbara Tawarova, Andrei Boleslavsky, uh, Wojtek Radakulan, as I told, and uh, also student of our academy, Viktor Shulik, with his uh, project, uh, um, kind of the PR to uh, narrate narrative or empty narrative situation. So let's see, and you're more than welcome to the, to the block. And parallelly, uh, or 
at the end, there is also quarter, quarter selection of Andre Turhan's uh, uh, games from it. So, so we will be playing tomorrow. It, it's not my games, but games I've selected on the intersection of art, uh, art and games. You don't even find arts. Okay. What? It's, it's not your games. I, it, I, it's not my games. So there's going to be a Doom modification where you are actually fighting against Margaret Thatcher, Bill Vila's video game. There's also going to be a Democratic Socialism Simulators and much more. So come and hang out and chill. And do you want to continue? I am okay. Yeah, so we also have uh, pass the mic to Philip. Yeah, it's about collective reading. Collective reading of uh, John Babies. Yes. Yeah. So that's tomorrow, and feel free to join us. We will be having text in Czech and also in English, and we will see about the audience, probably. Yeah, it's a really great mm -hmm. book about how uh, neoliberal ideology reactions get reflected in G Grand Theft Auto V, Saints Row 4, and other games, and it's really a thought-provoking text that will be coming out in Czech uh, uh, very soon, thanks to Silesian uh, University in Ostrava. So please come and read with us. Uh, we will also have uh, a new fun collective, queering games, artist talks, less presentation, frag collective, bonus level. Maslav may say something about that. And we will also have a League of Legends tournament. Yeah, that's what you want. Do you want to? Yeah, like that's the reason why we are here. It's the tiny bit of League of Legends. So we are we're still invited to for this like open uh, tournament. We will uh, determine the teams like to tomorrow uh, around 12 o'clock at the Digi Lab at uh, the architecture building. And hopefully we'll stream the finals at uh, 7 p.m. So that's that's the thing. So you can bet on who's going to win or you can just join because it's going to be casual and for everyone. And uh, I think everybody can attest that I'm really bad at League of Legends, so don't worry. There is an open uh, link for uh, joining the tournament, so feel free to click it and join. And probably this is everything for the introductions. So I would like to introduce Laura Obdebreke and Katarina Kovondova for our first talk concerning the uh, ecological crisis in games. And Laura is uh, Laura will start, and she's a, a PhD fellow at the University of Oslo. And her projects are concerning uh, temporalities of Anthropocene, and also she's a designer of LARP games. So it's your uh, yours and. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having me. What an amazing program. I uh, can't wait. Okay. Right Oh, uh, ready for a cut, right? Control. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Laura uh, Baker, and uh, you know, I was already introduced, but I, I guess just kind of out of uh, habit, I'll do it again. Um, so I'm a PhD fellow at uh, Oslo University, the um, Cultural Studies Department, and I'm currently my fourth and last year. Uh, I handed in my PhD thesis last summer, and I'll help you defend it next week. So uh, uh, part of that ceremony involves giving a uh, trial lecture. Hopefully the mic is going to be picking up on my voice now. <laughs> um, so uh, it's so part of the ceremony involves uh, giving a trial lecture on an assigned topic. And what I hope to do today is to give a trial trial lecture. Um, but fortunately, the topic is a relevant one because my dissertation is about Anthropocene temporalities in video games. The, uh, the Anthropocene, if you don't know, uh, is a term coined to describe a new geological epoch that is marked in an enduring material way by the impact of humankind which has led to truly disastrous changes in the global climate and biosphere. The new age will be known by a hotter, more unpredictable climate, sea level rise, and a severe loss of biodiversity. 
But from a cultural studies perspective, the new age will also be marked by a changing set of concerns and attitudes that reflect, respond to, and process this realization, constituting what I argue is a new structure of feeling, which is a quality or set of qualities that characterizes the sociocultural experience of a specific period. That's a lot, right? But, um, uh, but so uh, I guess to specify, my dissertation looks at recent single player video games in order to uh, tease out some of these Anthropocene concerns and attitudes, paying specifically uh, or paying attention specifically to notions of time and temporality. Uh, so my thesis asks how games give us access to the ways in which our conceptions and experiences of temporality have accrued new meanings and feelings in an age deeply impacted by climate change and other signs of environmental crisis. This focus on temporality is based on the assumption that our experience of time influences how we inhabit the world. Everyday rhythms, the felt trajectories of our lives, and the ways in which we experience the past, present, and future are all crucial in the establishment of a sense of agency and subjectivity. To conform to the topic of this conference, my talk today will draw from a chapter that is about the temporality of crisis, as well as about what I call dark seasonality, which uh, describes the increased thematization of unseasonal, unpredictable, and dangerous weather in entertainment media in general. Um, and I argue that perhaps as a response to the dawning realization that the world will be facing more extreme weather events more frequently, seasonality has achieved uh, a thematic prominence in many popular video games, primarily in farming simulators, um, however, seasonality in farming games is often, I find, pretty nostalgic. Um, these games represent the seasons as very regular, predictable, and proper, right? In the sense that in the winter, it's always going to be snowing. In the summer, it's always going to be nice and hot. And this, of course, does not agree with reality, um, where climate change is giving rise to new seasonal associations. Uh, for example, with drought, flooding, forest fires, and toxic algae blooms. Oh, yeah, that's the, the thesis. Um, today, actually, this, just this morning, I was uh, sent the link to the, uh, to the defense, and the defense is, in fact, a public event. So if you'd like to join, it might be a little boring, but there you go. The opportunity is there. The whole dissertation, as well as a public uh, file, I have a, um, a paper copy in my bag there. I'll put it on the table for you to peruse if you like, um, but you can also just get a link to the, the PDF online. So this is dark seasonality. Um, and now, there are also video games that engage with seasonality in a way that speaks to these new experiences of less predictable and more dangerous weather. And on this slide, I've collected a handful of video games that engage with this trend, just to give you a sense of its prevalence. In each of these games, uh, storms, floods, rain showers, or droughts occur at unpredictable intervals, creating challenges for players to overcome. In a rain world, periodically, lethal torrential showers punctuate play, driving you underground to find shelter. And in Death Stranding also features a kind of dangerous rain shower called time fall that speeds up decay and degeneration. Uh, and then the post-apocalyptic beaver town simulator Timberborn also hinges on a recurring dry season uh, that your beavers have to prepare for by damming enough water. Uh, and finally, there's the upcoming game Season, a, le uh, a Letter to the Future, and it looks like this game will tell the story of subsequent generations who experience uh, shortening lifetimes before a mysterious cataclysm washes away everything. Uh, it's going to be released soon, and I can't wait to play it. Uh, and then there's also the recently announced Diluvian Winds, which involves preparing for and rebuilding after a flood. So... Uh, Lots of games uh, sort of from the recent, uh, from recent years and also coming up. These are even more examples. Um, 
These were the games that I read and played more closely in my dissertation. Uh, and of these three, Frostbunk is the one that I will use as a case study in this talk. Now, I'm really curious, a uh, show of hands, who has played or is familiar with Frostpunk? Okay, this is great, terrific, because I'm happy that there are a few, but also I will be um, talking quite a bit about sort of explaining like, what, what's it feel like to play this game? How does this play? How does this work? Um, so that means that uh, I think everybody will be able to follow along. Um, in short, what I'll talk about is the temporality of crisis in Frostpunk, specifically its texture and its duration, and how they are achieved through visual design, audio, narrative, and game mechanics. To do so, I'm going to be drawing on some scholarship by Frederick Buell and Donna Haraway, among other people. And especially Haraway is known for um, uh, being a little bit creative with language. So uh, I've just put some of her key terms here on my slide. That way you'll recognize them when they come up later. And if any of these terms remain um, confusing or unclear, you can always just ask me later and I'll try and come back to them. But first, let's delve a little deeper into the way in which notions of environmental crisis have changed over the course of the last century. So in May 2019, a British uh, newspaper, The Guardian, announced that it would change the language it used to talk about the environment. Climate change would henceforth be known as the climate crisis or climate emergency. The hope was that by using more alarming language, the newspaper would wake, up, wake people up to the, the severity of the issue. Uh, and many other news outlets followed suit, and even governments beca began uh, announcing a climate crisis. Uh, in the long term, however, these announcements kind of bled back or like merged back into the everyday. But this doesn't mean that um, these announcements, sort of the, the, the feeling of urgency and, and, and emergency was lost. Uh, thinking of the time of the everyday and the time of crisis as entirely separate misunderstands the way in which emergencies emerge from the everyday where they can also stick around and become everyday emergencies. So how do emergencies become everyday? Um, well, uh, people have written about this, uh, uh, I mean, more competently than I am. I have, but um, they have basically uh, argued that uh, emergencies become everyday when they are subject to techniques of everydayification, which, uh, such as when they are anticipated in news media, simulated, pre-mediated in film and TV, or indeed sort of rehearsed in different kinds of performances, right? You could think of a, um, well, I don't know what kind of schools you guys went to, but sometimes at my school, there was like a fire drill or a bomb drill where you rehearse what you will do in that situation. That is a very literal form of sort of uh, the everydayification of an emergency. Um, so the everydayification of the environmental crisis has a history that is worth briefly recapping in order to frame the kind of temporality that I will be unpacking in my discussion of Frostpunk. Uh, it's been really expertly sum summarized in Frederick Buell's book, uh, From Apocalypse to Way of Life. Uh, I can heartily recommend this. He traces uh, the development from uh, apocalyptic thinking uh, in the immediate post-war era, characterized, of course, by fear of nuclear war, to the transformation of crisis uh, or crisis thought in the 20th century, 21st century. So uh, to save time, I'm just going to jump to his uh, conclusion. Um, Buell suggests that uh, one way to understand the contemporary experience of environmental crisis is through the metaphor of dwelling. Um, and to dwell in crisis means to live in it with crisis all around you, right? It means recognizing that a lot of damage has already been done and the potential to remediate or fix the damage is limited. More generally, uh, Buell argues to dwell in crisis, people need to work with a new economy of feeling, one that extends a variety of affects and effective practices to environmental contexts. So, um, I mean, affect theory is a sort of uh, its own field of in, in scholarship, but um, I'm not really an affect theory purist, so you, if, you're, if you don't know what affect is, you could think of it as emotion. Um, but the affects or emotions that belong to this new 
the new economy of feeling or this new um, uh, uh, experiential reality are not panic or hope, but rather doubt, anxiety, dread, grief, boredom, and grit. Uh, and grit is perseverance, roughly. So um, aesthetically, right, for Buell, these affects translate to a grimmer sense of realism and a focus on embodiment. He also argues that the uh, social and ethical responses to the experience of dwelling in crisis include what, quote, ecofeminists and Marxists call the work of reproduction as opposed to the work of production, end quote. And this kind of works involves the preservation and continuation of communities and basic care for those most vulnerable, rather than, for example, ambitions or naive plans to fix everything or to sort of achieve some kind of environmental redemption. Um, what Buell uh, describes as dwelling in crisis has been echoed elsewhere more recently and also more popularly by Donna Haraway in her saying, staying with the trouble. Um, so like Buell, Haraway is, all, is also uh, wary of framing the future in either dystopian or utopian terms, um, arguing that such futurisms hollow out the present as a space in which to live. On the contrary, she argues that staying with the trouble means accepting what she calls a thick present from which to act and through which, uh, through whose murkiness, all of our actions are inevitably compromised, inefficient, problematic, and yet deeply necessary. So what makes this present thick is the tangle of relations that we are always inevitably sort of becoming with or co-becoming, just kind of Her Donna Haraway-ish language. Um, so a thick present is always a thick co-present, right? It's a shared present. Um, it's a present that is shot through with, quote, times that remain at stake, in which the world is not finished and the sky has not fallen yet, end quote. For Haraway, these are times of action, right? Specifically of what she calls responsibility. Um, literally, the ability to respond. Um, but more importantly, responsibility includes care work, the work of nurture and perpetuation, the work of living and dying well together on a damaged planet. That's sort of a reference to Annette Singh, was this sort of a big source of inspiration for Haraway. So um, as I will continue to explain, Frostpunk, which is the game I'll get to in a second, is completely imbued or pervaded with this feeling of dwelling in crisis or staying with the trouble. It indulges neither cynicism nor a sense of unfounded optimism. Rather, Frostpunk is about making compromised decisions and Perseverance. Uh, it's a game that demands players to respond, but without, without making those responses uh, easy or maybe even satisfying. So for those of you who haven't played the game, uh, Frostpunk is a really tightly paced uh, city builder uh, that puts you in charge of a small group of people who have to scramble to survive in a climate changed world. Most immediately, you have to gather enough resources and uh, put all the necessary infrastructure in place to make it through a terrible storm that is looming on the horizon and which is predicted to hit in a matter of days. Oh. Uh, all right, so while, as you can tell, ostensibly Frostpunk is about global cooling and not global warming, as uh, Cameron Kunselman points out in an article, uh, this game is a pretty clear allegory uh, of uh, global warming or climate change, uh, one that engages with a host of relevant themes, extreme weather being one of them. Uh, playing a scenario in Frostpunk takes a little over three hours, uh, over the course of which you gradually, gradually flesh out a city in obeisance to a city plan of elegant concentric circles. Um, and uh, these circles radiate out from a main hub where a steam powered generator, this one, um, sort of keeps sort of the inner circles warm. 
Um, and uh, mm -mm. so what makes the game stand out to me beyond a seriously very good soundtrack is uh, a very tense buildup, right? That culminates in a dramatic finale during which the storm finally hits your city. And what, when it hits your city, it puts to the test all this heating infrastructure that you've built, the stockpiles that you've amassed, and citizen morale. Uh, and while this part of the game is definitely the most tense, I would say, the hours leading up to this, uh, this sort of finale are not free from worry either. So uh, from start to finish in this game, moments of crisis and consequence build on each other, giving the experience of a very drawn out accumulative ordeal. The experience of crisis, in other words, is both dramatic, spectacular, and protracted, drawn out, exhausting. So as a way into my um, analysis, let's use the game's uh, striking visual design as, a, um, as an opening sort of point. Um, so this visual design, the circular city layout, suggests to me two things, the face of a clock, and the uh, spoked wheel or a gear. Uh, and I think both these images speak to the game's central themes, uh, themes of time and industry, specifically industry as it relates to this idea of a society being a kind of well-oiled machine with each individual having a, a role to play. So let's do time first, I guess. Um, time in Frostpunk is almost tangible everything reminds you of uh, the passing of time. The movement of the sun across the sky casts really dramatic shadows uh, into the crater. Um, and then there's also a clock that sort of uh, keeps track of the hours. And then there's also a town, uh, <laughs> a town crier who's, um, who announces like the start and the end of every shift. Um, and there's also at the top of the screen, I think you'll find that here, at the top of the screen, a, um, a, a weather report or a sort of calendar that uh, anticipates the, uh, the, 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 the storm, but with a little bit of uncertainty, right? So as you can see in this, um, in this image at the very top there, you could see sort of maybe three days ahead, right? But not, no more, no more than three or four days ahead. All right, so meanwhile, um, while you have sort of this incredibly um, uh, present sense of time, of time ticking away, there is also a lot of work to be done. Uh, at the very start, your most pressing concern consists of building shelter uh, and setting up supply lines to secure uh, food, coal, and wood. But soon enough, uh, complications arise when machines break down, people fall ill, uh, and plans are hatched to abandon the city for other places of refuge. To persuade uh, people to stay, you have to manage an affective economy that tracks both hope and discontent. And those are the two bars that you can see at the uh, bottom of this uh, image. Um, so managing these bars means managing the city's morale. You can lose the game if you run out of hope or if you accumulate too much discontent after which you'll be thrown out and uh, game over. So to manage both hope and discontent, you have to juggle um, your workers' needs and demands. For example, more rations, relief from work, a place to house the sick, daily diversions, and childcare. Uh, most events in the game present as kind of small emergencies that have no clear-cut answers. Uh, once again, Cameron Councilman, points out that the game's decision system is, quote, clearly not meant to be an educational model to make us think about how we treat those who are crushed under the wheels of production. At best, it is a basic moral problem from the philosophy classroom, end quote. In other words, these are not, um, these are not issues that have the right or wrong answers, right? But both, the, there's no way to respond to this properly, basically. So these moments are merely, uh, they serve to make us feel bad, right? They allow us to experience the shrinking of options as resources grow scarce and the weather bears down on the city. For uh, Councilman, such gameplay marks Frostpunk as an affective climate change game 
one that is not invested in communicating scientific or systemic understanding, but rather in exploring how undergoing climate collapse feels. So I want to really underscore the durational dimension of this experience of playing the game. To speak to this aspect of the game uh, more directly, I think my analysis benefits from a brief, brief mention of uh, environmental cr crisis in, in climate fiction, right, in literature. So there's this really good book, it's called Anthropocene Fictions by Adam Trexler, and he describes the emergence of a trope called the flood as duration. He argues that while early flood novels use the trope of the flood to enact geographical compression um, or to sort of to tell a story about humanity more generally, more, uh, he argues that more contemporary flood novels um, expose the unequal distribution of suffering and the sociopolitical dynamics of floods. So, uh, more, so like many post-apocalyptic stories, Early deluge novels often play rather optimistically with the idea of, uh, of a new dark age, right? Assuming that like after the flood, you, we will be able to rebuild and we could be rebuild better than before. Um, but novels that engage with this idea of the flood as duration lay bare the more protracted nature of environmental crises. They ask what happens before the storm uh, and what happens after the clouds dissipate? What is the damage and how does the world stand to be rebuilt? What is the cost of survival and how does harm linger? Frostpunk uh, arguably tells the story of a storm as duration. Since a lot of its focus is on uh, the time you spend preparing for the storm, as well as all these tiny little decisions that have to be made uh, in the run up. Uh, and rather than linger on the causes of environmental crisis, the game emphasizes the political and cultural adaptations required, as well as the social cost involved in enacting these adaptations. Um, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, so sometimes events in the game encourage you to sign uh, a new decree in what is called the Book of Laws. Uh, for example, an event likely to trigger in the early game regar um, regards um, child labor, right? And the law pertaining to ch child labor. So the event description reads, a child got injured at work. And then you are pro uh, prompted to either ban uh, child labor, limit it to entirely uh, or relatively safe environments, or you say, mm, don't care, you know, move on as before. Um, and the Book of Laws is the game's decision tree. Uh, it features uh, only socio-political strategies of adaptation and resilience. For instance, um, strategies of adaptation include doing away with burial rites, right? Just chuck the corpses in a corpse pit, that's it. Um, or adding sawdust to bulk out meals. Or saving extra rations for the sick. Um, and however, uh, so, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit like a tech tree, but it's not a tech tree in the sense that the technologies there are more social technologies. And also in normal games or sort of more conventional games, I guess you always want to get to the end of the tech tree first, right? You want to like straight down uh, towards the better tech. Uh, in Frostpunk, that's actually not the best move um, because you might want to think twice about completing it because the most extreme measures that are available in the Book of Laws and the Book of Purpose, which is sort of the same, but part two, um, these decisions, these social technologies carry with them social costs. And, and these costs are tallied up at the end of the game to the player's surprise. So I guess it's a spoiler, but if you do, if you played this game for the first time, you don't think that making these uh, choices is going to sort of kick you in uh, kick you in the butt later. But in fact, the game remembers and the game sort of judges you for it by the very end. Mere survival does not translate to victory in Frostpunk, not if you've had to resort to fascism or religious fanatical uh, policies to make it happen. Um, so, as you can tell from this illustration, uh, Frostpunk is anything but secretive about its uh, thematic engagement with fascism. Um, 
while the adaptations offered in the Book of Laws are kind of harmless, but very, very unpleasant, the later adaptations are more blatantly ideological. So there's two uh, sort of sides to this tree. Uh, if you go down, you go the route of fascism. If you go up, you go the route of religious uh, fanaticism. So, um, and they're called the path of faith and the path of order. Um, so at the base of the tree, you will find solutions like um, the house of prayer or neighborhood watch. That sounds innocent, right? Think twice. Um, so choosing either of these laws will take you down these two different paths. Um, and while the persuasions uh, unlock different buildings and different abilities, ultimately both these paths lead to the same place. The most powerful law at the top of the tree um, they, so uh, if you sort of max out both sides, um, you end up in the same exact place. You end up with these laws, right? Um, with the introduction of the new faith, all who voice doubts will be branded enemies of the faith. Everyone must be devoted to the survival of our cause. All those who do not follow will be swept aside. And then, almost with the same language, with the introduction of the new order, all who voice doubts will be branded as traitors. Obedience is the highest virtue without which the city can survive. All those who do not follow will be swept aside. So, I mean, it's obvious both paths lead to totalitarian fascistic regimes. Uh, and the game is very, I think, quite sophisticated here. Uh, by cultivating a tone of urgency and alarm, which I think is very much emphasized by just this terrific soundtrack, um, Frostpunk gradually pressures you into uh, taking more and more oppressive actions to keep the city safe. This is a pretty textbook version of the logic of the state of emergency, um, which when uh, extended indefinitely gives the state license to acquire more and more power and to waive individual liberties. Um, but in Frostpunk, however, you're never actually required to make these choices, right? Uh, and the most challenging and the most coveted ending of the game requires you not to have crossed the line. Um, so I guess it's a little bit unclear like where the line is, but at the end of the game, there's three different endings. Uh, you didn't cross the line, you crossed the line a little bit, you definitely crossed the line, right? That's sort of the, the, the three uh, victory uh, states. So by dangling uh, the laws of faith and order in front of you, Frostpunk demonstrates how easy it is to resort to what is called eco-fascism in times of environmental crisis. Um, fascism is a uh, political, political form that seeks to revolutionize and uh, reharmonize the nation state through expelling a radically separate other um, and uh, doing so by paramilitary means. So uh, this is from a book by uh, Moore and Roberts. Uh, they've written uh, this book about eco-fascism. Um, uh, it's basically the same, it's fascism, but motivated by the threat of environmental crisis. And as Moore and Alex uh, Roberts explain, in the near future, uh, eco-fascism is likely to come in three different flavors. There is a uh, fossilized reaction that doubles down on fossil fuel production for the sake of energy independence. I'm gonna say that this is probably gonna be happening in Norway. <laughs> um, uh, so for the sake of energy independence and national security, it's also uh, it's obviously like a big motivator for the United States. Then the second one is a, a militarized response that manifests in resource warfare. And finally, there is the anti-technological doomsday prepper variety that seeks to accelerate the coming of the end for the sake of the survival of a select few. Of these futures, uh, Frostpunk plays most closely with the first and the third uh, of these eco-fascisms because um, in preparation for the storm, you are required to stockpile and mine thousands and thousands of units of coal to power the generator. Um, so because global warming is not an issue in the fiction, uh, Frostpunk allows players to engage quite freely and I think without guilt to uh, sort of uh, play with uh, ex extractivism and with um, the uh, mining of fossil fuels. 
And there's also in the first uh, in the first scenario of the game, there are these events that trigger uh, featuring instances of very heroic petro masculinity, such as when uh, at the very, just before the storm hits or while the storm is is waging, the coal mines start to freeze over, and you have to choose if you want to send in volunteer coal miners to keep the mines operational. And these volunteers, of course, may die in the process. Uh, and the game's second, so the uh, Frostpunk 2 is announced for this year. Really excited about it. And it's going to see, it looks like it'll be kind of digging into this sort of like uh, fossil fueled reaction more, uh, more uh, intensely. It is uh, set after the age of coal. Uh, the sequel will, um, will sort of uh, be about oil, really. Um, and specifically, this is interesting because the game, the, the sequel is going to reference this idea that um, the rumored potential of oil combustion to heat up the globe, right? So they're sort of really um, reflexively anchoring or like playing with this idea that in Frostbunk you can, you can play at um, being a sort of carbon tycoon dude. Uh, and I guess um, you don't have climate change or like global warming to worry about. So um, coming up to the end, I hope, um, while eco-fascism promises survival, it only does so through exclusionary practices. Uh, and Frostpunk makes this really, really clear. Time and again, the game will confront you with decisions about how and on whom to spend resources. In these moments of decision-making, the game is really asking who is part of the city and who is not. Are those uh, citizens who are gravely ill, are they citizen enough to be kept alive in hospital beds, or should they be mutilated and put back to work? Right? This is one of the decisions that you have to make. Uh, and what about the waves and waves of refugees that show up at your borders ahead of the storm? Um, do you let them in or do you refuse them? These are also decisions that you have to make. So the borders of the city sort of expand and shrink with the weather, right? If it is when it freezes or when it's colder, the borders shrink and may come to exclude the refugees gathered at the edge of the crater. Um, and when the temperatures plummet even further, uh, the borders might even cut off those working at the edge of the city um, where the buildings are too costly to heat. So there's a German scholar called uh, Lars Stolkemeyer who also reads uh, Frostpunk in light of the Anthropocene. And he argues that uh, unlike other sort of totalitarian city builders, Frostpunk evokes, quote, the sense of community or the experience of community, end quote. Uh, and in doing so, Dolkemeyer argues Frostpunk offers an opportunity for players to play with what Donna Haraway calls responsibility, right? Quote, the capacity to act not only for the sake of one's own survival, but for the survival of all members of a shared community, uh, end quote. So as I explained above, to act with responsibility means um, acknowledging that our world is neither certainly doomed nor about to be miraculously saved, but uh, that it calls for urgent action and care for a multitude of people and creatures with whom we live uh, on planet Earth. So this ethical stance involves an investment in, quote, for Dolkemeyer, the temporality of ongoingness, end quote, which is the temporality involved in the labor of reproduction and in the ethics of care. Uh, in Frostpunk, Dolkemeyer argues that this temporality manifests in, quote, the management of demise, end quote, which follows a logic of uh, constant deferment. Um, or doing one's utmost to steal another day, even though the morning looks very, very grim. <clears throat> so for Dolkemeyer, success, uh, Frostpunk is successful at doing this, right? Frostpunk successfully offers an experience of responsibility because it allows players to feel like they are able to act in and as a community. Um, and it is true that the game very emphatically urges players to always think and act on behalf of the city, right? It is always our city, not your city, our city. And um, uh, one of the sort of segments of the, the game is called the city must survive, right? Not um, your people, not an individual, the city. Um, 
So when individuals are featured, uh, for example, in pop-up events, they are very often unnamed, right? It's always a man, a worker. Um, and sometimes individuals, uh, they have little portraits and they do have names and they sometimes appear at the bottom of the screen. But I would say that the collective of the city looms much larger. And this makes it really easy to perceive of the city as a single machine and its citizens as potentially disposable parts. Obviously, this facilitates a politics of exclusion and sacrifice. As uh, Dolkemeyer's analysis attests, this can feel like an exercise in the expansion of empathy, right, beyond the self for a community, um, and an exper experience of what uh, Harry would call a, a thick co-presence, but I think we should nevertheless be a little bit more cautious about it. Um, so in this, um, I'm uh, inspired here by very important work uh, by Bonnie Ruberg and Rainforest Scully Blaker, who have written about the ambivalent politics of uh, empathy in video games. Uh, and they argue that we should sort of be a little bit more careful to sort of brand something an empathy simulator when um, these games very often endorse um, those who do the caring rather than those who deserve to be cared about. Right, so they're very often about like, oh, they give you this feeling that like, oh, aren't I good? You know, aren't I uh, uh, an em empathetic human being? When that's not really the point. <laughs> um, so I think Frostpunk walks a very fine line between a rhetoric of saviorism and survival through collective effort. While the victory screen uh, speaks in the second person plural, we survived. Uh, the city builder genre focuses power and agency in the hands of a single person. And the circular city layout really emphasizes that, right? Who is at the, at the heart of the, of the circle? It's you, it's the player. Um, so uh, it is only through the many events that trigger displaying the experiences and desires and portraits of the uh, many different kinds of citizens that their concerns are represented. So I think acting with responsibility means acting in collaboration with these individuals and with their concerns in mind. But as I've discussed, this is certainly not the easiest way to play um, this game. Um, since uh, the temptation to play it safe and to sign these really oppressive laws, disseminating propaganda and sacrificing scapegoats is uh, really very strong. So um, back to Haraway. Responsibility is always practiced in what Haraway calls a thick present, right? A present that is thick with relations and obligations, where actions have ripple effects that can be surprising. Drawing lines in the sand, right, between those who belong and those who don't belong, between those who are, um, between those who are of the city and those who threaten the existence of the city, actually denies the thickness of the present. Um, Frostpunk, I think, is an, an um, Frostpunk is an exercise in responsibility, but it's not a responsibility simulator, right? Because it requires quite some effort to um, to achieve this this uh, this feeling of, of of acting sort of for and on the behalf of a community and in a community. Um, yeah. The, reaching my conclusion, um, I hope that I haven't gone over time or anything, but um, kind of basically there are many different ways to think about um, the environmental crisis. Um, is it a crisis is temporary, uh, a crisis could be an opportunity, right, an opportunity for profit or for change, or a crisis is just an excuse for humans to become sort of more deeply entrenched in some of our worst behaviors, right? A crisis is sort of the excuse to, to show our, the worst side of ourselves. Um, uh, and in this talk, I've argued, uh, building on work by Frederick Buell and Donna Haraway, that um, crisis is a new experiential reality, somewhere uh, we dwell, right, where we live. And this reality is marked by different kinds of temporality. I also hope to have demonstrated a kind of implicit, implicitly maybe, and I'm also working on kind of developing this more and wanting to be more explicitly about, wanting to be more explicit about kind of 
my philosophy of time, I guess. Um, so I hope to have demonstrated that time is a modality in video games that you can analyze by asking, how does it feel to act? How does it feel to slice through the medium of time? Uh, in Frostbunk, I think that the difficulty of making choices, the exhausting nature of the game, which really leaves you quite breathless towards the end, speaks to the temporality of crisis. Um, and Haraway, once again, uses that phrase, uh, the thick present, to describe it. Uh, and I'm going to make the metaphor really, really concrete. Um, uh, so if, I'm, uh, if making a decision requires slicing the flow of time into at least two paths, right? The actual path that you take and the virtual path that you could have taken, then um, the thicker the flow of time, the more effort it would take to slice it with an action. Um, so a thick present is a, uh, a present shared with other beings um, to whom we are responsible and with whom we co-create the world. It names a particular quality that marks progresses, processes of decision-making in the Anthropocene, explaining why taking action is hard, compromised, and yet deeply necessary. And Haraway's uh, thick present does not defer to futurisms, uh, apocalyptic or uh, unduly optimistic. Rather, it's imbued with doubt, anxiety, but also perseverance and grit. And uh, I hope I've communicated that these are exactly the temporal affects that are invoked in games like Frostpunk. That's the end of my talk. I'm very happy to answer questions or to just hear comments. Thanks. Thank you for a, a great uh, lecture. And since we are a bit in delay, I would like to uh, move the discussion after uh, Katarina's uh, uh, lecture. And because, yeah, uh, so we don't delay that much. And yeah, I would like to introduce Katarina Komandova, uh, a Czech uh, journalist writing extensively on ecological crisis in uh, games. So the floor is yours. And we will have a short discussion after the lecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, as you can see, my name is Katarina and I'm writing about games because I actually love playing games and I love thinking about them. And I believe that games can be a very powerful tool because they can give us completely new perspective. They can put us in shoes of someone completely different than we are. They can educate us on many topics and uh, they can give us very valuable lessons and ideas that we can later bring into our real life. And one of those games is Final Fantasy VII from 1997 and its remake from 2020. Now, when you look at some screenshots from the game, you may get a completely different idea what the game is about. But if you put all the flashy fightings and huge swords and fancy dresses and beautiful people aside, you actually get a story that deals heavily with trauma, guilt, loss, mental health and oppression, social inequality and environmental crisis. The story takes place on a planet called Gaia. Beneath its surface flows live stream, which you can see as a plot of the planet. Uh, it gives life to new beings, from plants to animals to humans. And when anything dies, it comes back to the live stream, back to the planet. It brings together uh, their emotions, memories and knowledge, which is stored in the live stream. It also has a function of a uh, planet's immune system. So when there is some damage done to the planet, the live stream flows there and heals it. If you have ever heard of Gaia hypothesis, you may be familiar with the concept. It's named after uh, Gaia from Greek mythology. Uh, she was personification of Earth and mother of all. Uh, the hypothesis is from scientist James Lovelock, who believed that uh, Earth and living beings are working as this huge superorganism, and they are working together to create conditions perfect for living. 
So we are not just part of the atmosphere, we are creating it, so it is suitable for living. Uh, so if we look at ourselves as part of the planet, as part of the atmosphere, and if we see the planet's health as our own, we should probably try to take care of it and not try to destroy it. Before the game takes place, uh, some people from a weapon manufacturer called Shinra actually found out that if, if they extract and process the live stream, they can get a very powerful energy supplier. And if they process it a little bit more, they even get something called materia. It's basically an item that allows you to uh, use the knowledge stored in the live stream. And what it means in game is like you can summon creatures, you can boost your abilities and you can do all cool stuff. And uh, they were like, wait, this is actually pretty good. We can gain some profit from it. We can, we can make a lot of money and get a lot of power if we use it. So they built a lot of macro reactors all over the planet and they started draining the live stream and they started prospering. And while they were building their empire, the planet was slowly dying. You can see it uh, since the beginning of the game. It takes a city called Midgar. And if, when it comes to uh, hunting and uh, gaining power, not only environment and nature suffers, people do too. And Final Fantasy VII is not very subtle about it. So uh, at the bottom of the city, there are slums. Only poor people live there. The, Water and air are polluted, monsters are roaming around, crime, organiz crime organizations leave the place, and the people don't even see sunlight. They see just junk and trash, and the reason is a huge metal plate that is right above them. The plate where the actual city takes place, where middle class and rich people live, they are comfortable lives, thanks to macro energy, and they don't really care about those below them. Like, they're just poor people and who cares about them, right? And at the center of it all is the headquarters of Shinra Electric Power Company. The company that has immense power and immense influence in all spheres, from politics to infrastructure to all social problems. And uh, if we relate uh, Final Fantasy VII to our real world, we can see macro energy as a combination of all problems that are related to ecological crisis. And we can see Shinra as real life all companies that have pretty good power. Companies that don't really care about environment or people and companies who pretty much see just the profit and who are pretty okay with blaming actual people, regular people like us for all that is, that is going on. Like it's your fault that you are traveling too much you should use less energy, you should uh, recycle more, you should stop shopping, you should do this and that. And of course, like all our choices are important and it doesn't mean that we should like, don't care and throw plastics everywhere. But uh, are we really the real cause? Are we really the problem? Or, are, or is it the companies that are actually producing all that stuff? Uh, there was this, uh, study from 2017, Daiban CDP, and the report showed that 71% uh, of commissions are done just by 100 companies. In those commissions are included the commissions from uh, the consumers, just like us. So some people saw it as uh, this argument, where is demand, there is supply. But when it comes to the demand, and we don't really have much choice. Not everyone can move closer to their work. Not everyone can buy more ecological car. Not everyone can just change their energy supplier. So by blaming regular people, it actually shifts focus from the main problem, which is these huge companies uh, the, and politics who actually chose how the infrastructure looks like. Regular people didn't. Regular people didn't choose that uh, we will be sold uh, products that don't last long and that uh, can be repaired much. Uh, so uh, if we want to look at the possible changes, we need to look way beyond the choices of individuals and their lifestyle. 
And Final Fantasy does that. It doesn't care about individual responsibility and it blames Shimra. So from the slums, there comes this ecological activist group called Avalanche. They want good for the planet, they want to save it, but they don't really choose good means to it. They choose violence. They are basically eco-terrorists who, during the day, they help regular people, but during the night, they go to macro reactors, plant a bomb on it, and make it go boom. While doing so, they kill a bunch of uh, Shinra workers and guards who are just doing their jobs. And the explosions usually kill innocent people too. It breaks their homes, destroys cars, and basically damages their whole society, destroys lives of innocent people. And people are angry about that. Shinra doesn't help it with their propaganda at all, making Avalanche the bad guys. But uh, they didn't really see any other options. They were desperate. Their conditions were horrible. Then they, know, they knew what was going on on the planet. And they knew that Shinra wouldn't actually listen. Some poor people saying, oh, you're hurting planet, please stop. So I don't think that Final Fantasy VII is trying to tell you, hey, go attack the nearest company. It, telling, it tells you that uh, you, should, you should make a change while, while you can, while you don't have to choose violence. That we should really focus on uh, um, choosing different options and making things better while we, while we still can. So it's kind of sad when the company that is behind this game and behind this message is kind of missing its point. I'm pretty sure that most of you have heard about NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens. They are basically a digital certificate of ownership of some digital item, be it song, picture, or in-game item. And while they seem uh, not really harm harmful in the concept and they're just like uh, mean for people who can say, oh, I own something you don't, they are pretty demanding on energy. And some reports even say that the technologies that are used by NFTs are uh, that they need the same amount of energy as small countries. And after this huge criticism, some uh, blockchain technologies started to be more eco-friendly and they promised they will be carbon neutral in future. The damage was still done and the message was still sent. So for the publisher and developer of Final Fantasy VII to start selling their own NFTs is kind of a huge irony and a slap in the face of all the fans. Uh, Square Enix wants to make their own NFT games. They plan to have their own cryptocurrency. And they are also releasing this set of figures with beloved characters from Final Fantasy VII. The figures comes with NFT certificate. From $130, you can have the physical figure and NFT certificate. And if you pay a little bit more and you pay 160, you will also get a digital figure for some reason. And you can't choose to buy just the physical one. You, you need to get a certificate. And it feels like the company either missed the point or just doesn't care. And to use characters like that who would oppose this technology as much as they could, who would fight to their last breath to stop something like this, to get more money, to get more influence maybe, it's just, it's sad, honestly. And uh, the president of the company uh, really believes in NFTs. He dedicated most of his New Year's report uh, to NFTs, and he even said that those who, those who don't want it or, or don't agree with it, they just don't understand, they didn't get it. He's not willing to listen, just like Shinra wouldn't. And it makes you think, the remake of the original game added a lot of things. Not only just visual, but a story-wise too. And one of the things it added was these mysterious entities called Whispers. They are later revealed that they are fate-enforcing. They are blocking paths to the characters so they wouldn't uh, change directions 
from the first game. They are saving lives of some and they are trying to take lives of others. They are later defeated and it only, not only it does uh, give uh, more creative freedom when retelling the story, it also sends a really good message to, to the players that it's not late to change something, that you can still make a difference. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for uh, okay. <clears throat> we have some time for the discussion. So, yeah. So, if you have any questions for, uh, okay. so if you have any questions for Laura or Katarina, please ask them. And yeah, uh, are there any questions right now? Okay. okay. <laughs> Hello, uh, I might have one for uh, Katarina, considering that you mentioned the NFTs and the approach of the game development studios to the NFTs. I heard uh, sort of an anecdote which, which looks at it from the other side and that I think the next stalker was supposed to actually include NFTs and then there was a huge outcry online against that and they actually, the company actually changed its policy. So uh, it's kind of a I guess a positive story on you know on the same same theme. I'm wondering, uh, can you maybe share other uh, particular uh, cases or how did uh, the development of the development firm of Final Fantasy VII, the remake, actually uh, kind of simply blithely you know do away with this whole um, kind of feeling sentiment online? Um, thank you. Um. Yes, uh, a lot of companies, uh, game developers, wanted to include NFTs in their games. Uh, not only the ones behind Stalker, but uh, I believe Ubisoft wanted to. And after the criticism, they backed out and they were like, okay, we will listen to you. If you don't want that, maybe we will figure out something else. Uh, Square Enix is not like that. Um, they started talking about NFTs in uh, late 2021 when they were like uh, started developing a game with original IPs and uh, they they have huge plans with NFTs. Um, I, I believe this year one of those games should come out and uh, they are working on their cryptocurrency. They wanted to include it in their games that you can actually make some in-game items and sell it to others. So they believe uh, it will help games become this uh, alone ecosystem that can work for itself. Uh, and uh, I don't think they will back down from it. Uh, like, yeah. So are there any further questions? A quick question for Katarina. Yep. You said um, <laughs> you said that in um, uh, Final Fantasy VII, you said that uh, ultimately the game does not um, uh, encourage its players to be become eco terrorists. Why? When? Yeah. Uh... The game deals with uh, doubts a lot, mm -hmm. and the characters themselves question a lot if they could choose a different path, if the violence was actually the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And they all come to the conclusion that uh, it wasn't. Uh, so they regret the yeah. actions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even the most uh, loud one, Barrett, mm -hmm. uh, the huge guy with a machine gun instead of arm, mm -hmm. uh, he's in the end. Uh, uh, he realizes that his uh, choices weren't the best one, and he realizes that he cared most about revenge, mm. that uh, his actions was fueled by, by revenge for the most part. But I wonder to what extent that that message comes across as persuasive when, so I've, I've not played this game, I've seen, the, I've, I've seen some left play material, but um, it, how can you, it's a little bit um, two-faced, right? To offer really cool missions with really cool yeah. explosions and like, like tense, cool action sequences. And then 
uh, at the end go, oh, no, actually, we, we kind of regret those. those, those. Yeah. I mean, that's not incredibly persuasive or um, genuine, right? Yeah, like you can see it from the beginning, uh, especially in the remake where the visuals are much more better and much more realistic. So after the first mission, when you blow up the first reactor, you go through the debris, you see people crying, you see people hurt, there are flames everywhere. Uh, there is a kid who's like, oh, where am I going to go now? Like, I don't have home, I don't have parents. Mm. And, and you see that. And through the story, people, the characters are like, yeah, but the planet is what matters, right? We are doing for this better, better cause, mm. because if we don't stop Shinra, what will happen? The planet will, will die. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it, seems, it strikes me as a really ambivalent game, also because of what you said about how the Mako, mm -hmm. like the crystallized Mako, the material, Mako, whatever, yeah, yeah. how that... Uh, it becomes a resource that's valuable mm -hmm. to the player as well, right? For upgrading yes. weapons and mm -hmm. skills and whatever. So even though you know that it comes at, you know, within the fiction, it comes at such a cost. Yes. Uh, nevertheless, like mm -hmm. it's something that's coveted and yeah. you want to acquire. Like, there is nature material too that like yeah. comes from geysers mm -hmm. uh, through the planet, but most of it is manufactured. Mm -hmm. And like, I think it brings the question like, uh, do the violent actions are they justified by by the goal and i don't think it's up to everyone to answer this question for themselves and for what they believe mm -hmm. and i think that final fantasy is uh, the game about choosing lesser evil mm -hmm. like either you do nothing and the planet slowly dies or you do some bad stuff in hope that it will be better in the long run mm -hmm. yeah and of course like the game takes a different direction later, where, where there's like, uh, there's like a meteor coming to Earth and you kind of want to stop that and you want to stop this uh, big villain who has a uh, failed experiment and like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fun for the game, so... <laughs> there's always an asteroid. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. It uh, reminds me of another game that, that is in fact, or was... Um, uh, was sort of uh, um, it was in the news for su supposedly encouraging players to become eco terrorists. This is a game called Thunderbird by uh, Elizabeth La Pense, who's a Native American game designer, and it's a uh, it's a pretty simple game. It's kind of like you play a Thunderbird and you just like attack uh, uh, extractive equipment, right? So big lorries that are. Uh, there are two. This is specifically, I think, um, uh, the, the Athabasca oil sands, right, in, in Canada. Um, so it's like you, you play this Thunderbird and you're just like shredding uh, uh, big extractive equipment. Uh, so that is kind of like un, unapologetically uh, um, sort of indulgent, like allowing players to be a little bit eco terrorists um, or like. At no cost of life, of course, but to the co co great cost of equipment. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was thinking about these games, and would you imagine them being implemented in, in schools? You think that would be? Um, did you mention that they they are like moral or ethical uh, like tests? Mm. You know, or like did you games in general? Um, mm, Frostpunk and these sort of decision making games, right. maybe like Final Fantasy uh, two, mm. and whether you could. Uh, you would encourage them to be used as like a teaching resource mm. within schools. Mm. Uh, yeah, this, I get this question a lot, I think, because a lot of people, because obviously uh, 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 young people play a lot of games and you kind of want to speak to young people in their own language. I would say that Frostpunk is too expensive and too uh, big a game to play in a school, but also because, like I said, the scenario takes three hours and you would need to... Um, and so, so I, I think it lacks a certain like accessibility, right? You would need to do it in a school that has really good computers where you can just spend three hours playing this game. I think if those uh, tools are available, go for it. 
But there are other games that you could very easily play in school, which um, which um, get you to kind of, in the same way, think about uh, a community and how you build a community, how you uh, how you manage different stakes and different interests. Uh, specific, these are all like TTRPGs or tabletop role-playing games. They are analog games. So often all you have to do is you got to, you print a PDF and then that's it, right? And the, the, the computer is the human brain and that does all of the, the number churning and the imagining. And I think because they're um, less techy, they're more accessible. Um, and they do uh, some of the same, sort of they stage some of the same drama. And um, uh, there's a couple of really good ones. I think one of them is called Solar Punk Futures. So just Google, I think it's solarpunkfutures.w2tf. Um, and it's a, uh, it's basically kind of a, a game where you kind of reminisce, right? So you, you, you come together at this sort of like people's assembly and it's a solar punk future. So everything's been solved. The crisis has been averted, but you remember how that was done. And so you come up with these ancestor characters and you sort of uh, tell a, a collaborate, uh, collaboratively, you tell a story about how uh, different kinds of challenges were, uh, were tackled. Challenges like homelessness or borders or, you know, like uh, pollution or whatever. Uh, and that, so that, that you can sort of, you can pick that up and start playing within like 10 minutes. It's really, really good. And it gets, uh, it, it's really, yeah, so it's very uh, accessible. And then there's another one which is maybe requires a little bit more prep, but it's called uh, The Quiet Year. It's very famous in the indie TTRPG world. This is a very small world, but very famous there. Uh, and that one is also really, really good because you, you don't play an individual character. So for people who are a little bit averse to role play, who think that it's scary to, to kind of uh, step into the shoes of a character, in this game, you sort of, you, 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 the, so the game has this sort of just like God's eye view where you are, the four of you, four or five uh, players kind of make decisions about a community. And this game has been uh, hacked, right? Or reskinned, which happens all the time in the TTRPG community. Uh, and there's a couple of really good reskins, for example, the transition year, which is about, um, so say like tomorrow, all of the established powers in the city uh, retreat. So, you know, go government is gone, um, uh, like corporate interest is gone. You have one year to figure out, like, how do you build society in those ruins? Um, and uh, that one is, is also specifically kind of about like um, living, uh, rebuilding uh, kind of in, in face of the climate crisis. So I, and I, there's a bunch of these that I have kind of listed somewhere. So if you're interested in, in, in playing games with young people at schools or whatever, I would say um, definitely go for these TTRPGs first. And then maybe I, ha I have a couple of video games as well that could be helpful, but those definitely require more technological savvy also on the part of the educator. And to your knowledge, um, is this data of how players are making their decisions? Is it being collected on some mass scale? Um, no, I, I doubt it. I think no. in, um, well, I think in, uh, just because like these are all commercial games, so they're not really like uh, public experiments or whatever. I think for that kind of data, you should, um, you could look at um, online games, right? So, and in, in that case, you might want to look at a game called Eco which is a, a massive multiplayer online game uh, about uh, building a, a sustainable um, society and also averting an asteroid, right? The asteroid is the ultimate sort of analogy for climate change. It's not a very good analogy, but it's one that is very often used. Uh, so Eco is, is, one, is a, a, an online game where I think you could do that kind of research um, if, you, uh, if you build a server and you, if you, if you purchase a server and then you uh, find a way to fill it with, with, um, with players, but then you would have to ask each and every one of those players to sign a form to say that their, um, their play style is the subject of, of research, basically. I do that personally, but it'd be great if a games company would.
Sorry, say again? I wouldn't want to do that personally, but it'd be interesting if a games company would. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had the kind of sociological toolkit to do that, and I'm working on it, but uh, yeah, it requires uh, a d kind of disciplinary background that I do not yet have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your talks. Um, just one uh, small remark to um, just something that uh, came up in my mind that I've, uh, that it, isn't it kind of uh, fascinating that a lot of storytelling in when it comes to difficult moral questions um, is actually done through like the ending, which is so funny that yeah, basically you play a game and then you do what you do and you take decisions and in, in, in those games of, uh, that you both describe, or especially you, it's tough decisions that you have to take and you wonder if it's good or not. And then in the end you kind of have this redemption day where then kind of your deeds are valued and you see if you had been good or bad yeah. <laughs> you go to hell or, or, to, or to heaven. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of funny, but it would also be interesting if there would other, if there would be other forms of um, giving you a feedback of mm. how, how, what you did uh, without having this definite answer in the end. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's very uh, sort of, yeah, like, Judgment Day, isn't it? Yeah. Like the, at the end. I mean, I, once again, I would say in TTRPG space, uh, uh, I think you find that. So the the Quiet Year, the game that I talked about, has this mechanic where if somebody takes, uh, if some, if another player makes takes an action that you don't agree with or where you feel like you haven't been heard, you you take a a, a token of contempt. So if you're playing a very tense game, by the end of it, you will each have this like pile of tokens of contempt. And that sort of represents the, the extent to which your community, um, I guess, is sort of uh, it, it is, is conflictual, right? Or the extent to which sort of you, you, you've been acting with consensus. But I agree with you. There, I'm, yeah, it'd be really cool for, uh, for people to experiment more with those kinds of feedback mechanisms. So we have uh, still some time for uh, one last question, if there is any. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm wondering, and throughout especially, I mean, both of the critical uh, explications of those games, I was wondering uh, how much of a uh, of an issue for dealing with issues like climate change and the governance and the possible ways of tackling those and imagining societies and stuff like that is there because of the, I guess, entertainment based approach to game mechanics and game design where a company like 11 bit studios might have some sort of message but they also have to drive engagement, sell games, and so forth, and keep it competitive on the market. So, I mean, do you see, do you both, I guess, see some sort of uh, tension there uh, that perhaps can be resolved or ever can be resolved? You probably know what I mean. <laughs> like, what I'm, obviously, what I'm hinting at also in some more academic sense is, for example, some querying. Um, queer approaches to games that are not supposed to be fun or that the fr friction is part of the experience or maybe games that are deployed in artistic settings but they do seem a very like almost effectively different than what games that employ climate topics in the more entertainment discourse have to do mm. thank you uh I feel like a company needs to sell their product, right? So they want them to be entertaining and they want to get the attention and they want people to buy it. And a lot of people want to buy the game for to have fun. So the game plan has to be fun. And for it, it for a lot of people, uh, the fighting and the game, uh, all the fun stuff uh, is what brings them to the game, or at least at first. 
so I feel like for the company, it's necessary to, to use those things. And unfortunately, I feel like for some people, they, they just focus on the gameplay and they don't really think about the story that much. So the message and the story can kind of get lost in that, unfortunately. Yeah, and I guess I would say, I mean, I'm quite uh, optimistic, mostly because uh, I don't, uh, maybe I don't know, maybe I'm sort of blissfully ignorant of the uh, sort of this like NFT gaming craze or the sort of like, uh, I don't know, all of like the horrifying stuff that's going on in that, <laughs> in that space. I'm um, very much plugged into the uh, uh, indie uh, TTRPG, the indie gaming space, where I think there's a huge, uh, there's a there's inc there's uh, a lot of um, uh, thinking about sort of like ethical consumption or ethical game making, where there are these kind of alternative uh, economic systems and uh, um, uh, sort of uh, development incentives that uh, allow for different developers to kind of pursue the uh, the creative projects that they want to pursue. Um, without having to compromise too much on their uh, on their vision, and necessarily, I think these are. Uh, I mean, it's a there's less money involved, but I don't think that more money equals a better game. More, so, uh, and I think uh, lots of uh, lots of developers also. Uh, I mean, fingers crossed. More and more of this will also be funded through the uh, public sector. Um, as games become a kind of bigger medium and as governments or, or you know, the Ministry of Fur Culture in, in, in Czech Republic, maybe, as they're sort of waking up to uh, the, the impact of the gaming industry, I think maybe more and more uh, we're going to see uh, 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 sort of uh, economic support for better, more sustainable, sort of more woke games, hopefully. Uh, and if not that public support, I think there are a lot of uh, uh, I mean, there's Patreon. There's a lot of like people who um, uh, I think there's a lot of ethical consumption in some in some parts of the world and in some parts of very niche cultural industries. Uh, so I would definitely just kind of uh, with re with uh, regard to that that question, I would say that the games industry is a there's a lot of different types of game developers, right? And so to be really uh, pessimistic about the corporatization or sort of the profit motive, uh, I think maybe sort of that applies to some developers and some, uh, some sort of uh, places within the landscape, but it also doesn't apply to others. Uh, and I would say that if you want to have fun and if you want to play good games, you don't need to be pandering to these. You don't need to be playing um, whatever... NFT horror Square Enix is dreaming up. You know, there's other games, they'd say. Yeah, I feel like the better choices in this are the indie games. That the mainstream ones are usually the ones that doesn't apply. It's, they they thrive on consumerism. Like when it comes to Final Fantasy VII, like the, the original game was like 40 hours long and they decided to remake it. And the first part of the remake covers like first few hours of the game, oh and it's like forty hours long. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> Who has that time? To ask them? Yeah, and also they uh, they sell the uh, the side story. It's like a DLC, five five hours long, and it's a PlayStation Five exclu exclusive. So if you played the, the remake and wants to play the exclusive, you have to buy the, the new console. So. Yeah. So basically goes against the message against consumerism. Thank you. So we will probably stop here and uh, we will have like a short break, about yeah, 10 no. minutes, 10 minutes. And then if there are any further questions, we will probably have the discussions in the evening. So you can still ask. And yeah, that's it. See you in a bit. And uh, we will resume our program with the second panel. Uh, uh, it, we will present uh, two really nice guests, uh, Alfie Baum first and then Vibohan. 
Uh, it, uh, I don't really think it's necessary to introduce Alfie since he is here for the for the second time uh, on this like second second iteration of our conference. So we really have like a, a big link uh, with, with his with your work. Um, um, he teaches on Royal Holloway, maybe just one information, and his most recent book is Dream Lovers, The Gamification of Relationships. So with that, I can give the place for you. Great, thanks. Can you hear me and everything? Yeah. Great, thanks for having me again. Thanks for inviting me back, uh, Fat Clav and Andre. It's great to be here. It's really um, cool to like um, be part of this community. I, I like came last year and really um, got a lot out of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, thanks for coming. And I, I think um, what I said I would talk about was, uh, uh, I mean, last time I was here, I, I think I talked about gamification. Um, and I thought I would, I would try to talk a bit about um, slightly different aspects of games. And I'll talk about video games towards the end. But I wanted to think more about like play, the concepts of play, um, and especially um, the question of politics of play, I guess. Um, so two things made me uh, want to like address this topic. So I'm going to talk like about play itself. I'm going to start with, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit at the end towards how this relates to video games as a kind of adult play. Um, but like um, two things kind of made me want to do this uh, topic. Uh, first of all, uh, a couple of years ago, my uh, five-year-old daughter came home from school uh, with this like red, bright red note in her book bag. They have a book bag. And uh, it uh, says incident report, you know. So I thought, oh, she's banged her head or something like that. And um, it said, actually, uh, she was in trouble, right? And it said um, they'd been playing in the playground at school and they were playing um, shops, right? Like a little capitalism simulator or something where the children, you know, one's a shopkeeper and they pop it up and say, oh, you know, I'll sell you this imaginary bread or whatever. And uh, a problem arose in this game of shops. And, and my daughter didn't have enough imaginary money for the imaginary item, right? Um, so um, she said that she would uh, come back with an axe and uh, cut the heads off all the other. Uh, customers uh, and uh, just take the imaginary item for herself and peel through it and that would make it much easier to, to get the, the, the item. Uh, and so uh, the school obviously reported this in the form of a red note and at the time I thought, come on, you know, it's just a laugh, you know. Uh, and I wanted to think a bit more about what this actually means uh, and so on. Uh, and I was kind of um, reminded of it again this uh, this month. I don't know if you guys have seen online, I'm sure you have, you know, I know how much you guys are into memes in general. This kind of like um, Andrew Tate versus Greta Thunberg thing. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to say too much uh, uh, lest I get in trouble. Um, but, uh, you know, this kind of silly opposition between Andrew Tate and Greta Thunberg. And I read about a school in the UK, uh, this time a secondary school, um, where the, a, a student had been um, in science class, coughing under his breath in praise of Andrew Tate. So sort of like this. Andrew great. You know, like kids do when they're sort of 13 or something, to hide an insult or something like that. And the British school had sent a text home to all the parents at the school saying that um, there'd be a serious, serious investigation if any of the students were found siding with Andrew Tate in the war against Greta Thunberg or whatever. Um, and again, I thought, you know, regardless of, of what side you're on, and I, I don't think it's particularly good to... Um, you know, I'm sure Andrew Tate is not particularly great and has his issues, and I'm also sure that threatening to cut people's heads off with an axe is not great behaviour, and maybe they both deserve a, a red note, I don't know. But what I think is interesting is how the, there's a certain sort of policing of play uh, that is getting further and further back into, um, uh, into childhood, right? So thinking about how uh, there might be a shift in the sort of politics of play, uh, and I think there's a certain approach um, which is that we should press out dangerous play further and further back into childhood uh, in order to make sure that it doesn't sort of come back to bite us in the arse in the form of violence or fascism later down the line. I'll think a bit about uh, that. Uh, so this incident with my daughter's school was one reason why I wanted to sort of start talking about um, childhood play in relation to, to this. And the second one uh, is that I was sent a, a book um, to review, for like a peer review for a publisher. And this book argued that 
um, we need to decolonize play. Um, now, I, I think that's really interesting. You know, like these arguments which are usually applied to curriculum and so on, like, uh, you know, we have a uh, lot of white men writing books and we need to diversify and, and decolonize the curriculum, right, and change that. Uh, and actually this book was, was quite good and I ended up suggesting they publish it. But nevertheless, I found this idea like quite frightening, actually, that we should actually try as adults to sort of reconstruct or police and change the play of children uh, in, and, and this also related in this book to video games so that it becomes more in line with our own politics or whatever because it struck me that like play could perhaps be the one thing we don't need to police right uh, in the same way as we do other things or perhaps the last thing we should so i found these two instances or three instances kind of like interesting uh, and it, so they suggested to me that there might be a, like a political shift in the role that like play uh, has and how we relate to it and they also both kind of worried me slightly um so i want to like think think that through a bit and see where, where play sort of fits in with contemporary politics in this way um, and the reason why I called this talk something like uh, can the left learn to play uh, is because it seems to me that um, leftist ideas or progressive ideas are on the side of regulating uh, spaces of play, uh, whereas, um, and we've seen in recent years, the right knows very well how to play. Um, so um, I, I want to sort of think that, that through a little bit. Um, a good example of that last point um, would be that uh, example if, again, you know, I'm sure from uh, you know, a bunch of digital activists like yourselves are familiar with it, but this um, incident with Shia LaBeouf's art project, um, He Will Not Divide Us, right? I can see some faces of recognition, this moronic art project, but basically to, to summarize what happened, um, the artist, I think, who's called Luke Turner, uh, maybe sort of disingenuously using the fame of Shia LaBeouf, Shia LaBeouf, um, you know, put on this, um, he will not divide us, it was called referring to um, Donald Trump, right? And this, uh, and the idea was they got this space, it was in Brooklyn, I can't remember the name of the gallery, but it was an outdoor space in Brooklyn with a 24-7 camera streaming live to the internet, this, this art space, where Shia LaBeouf and others would continuously, 24-7, chant the words, he will not divide us, right? Referring to he is, is presumably Donald Trump in his formulation, us is the US, I guess, uh, uh, um, or the idea of united America. Um, so um, this, you know, can be thought of as a kind of, you know, anti-play, in my opinion, because it's extremely didactic, it's telling people exactly what to do, uh, you come there, you perform in a certain way, people did it in their own way, right, some people dressed up in some uh, fancy clothes, you know, add a few other signifiers that they were their own personal political causes into the mix or whatever, um, but generally speaking, uh, this was a space of, you know, quite a regulated play, I would say, uh, and this is in some ways an embodiment of how the liberals who teach at my daughter's school would like play to be. Um, and uh, then uh, things took a turn for the better or the worse, depending on your perspective. And um, people on image boards such as 4chan started to troll, troll, sorry, sorry, um, troll um, this uh, art project by uh, doing various silly things, right? Some of which did, of course, indeed verge on, um, you know, sort of far right or alt right as people were calling it at the time um, ideas and some of which were just really silly nonsense like turning up and pouring milk all over your face uh, and uh, things like that and I, i'm gonna i'd like to have a few minutes in a moment to compare the milk pouring of vegans in selfridges with the milk pourings of the 4chan bros uh, and the he will not divide us things um, if i get time I'll, I'll do that but um you know and they they uh they sort of baited the the honest participants into making a fool of themselves they put out lots of um, dog whistles and stuff to uh, particular online stuff so it became this quite um, um diverse um multiple digital nonsense and immediately, of course, um, they, well, I mean, they were, they were, it, um, this kind of play was associated with the right, right, and the liberal media, you know, you get an easy formulation where it's the liberals he, who, who sit, who can't, he will not divide us on loop because they've been told to, having their little bit of play, and then you get this disruptive play, which is this crazy stuff, which gets immediately accused of as being right-wing, it's not dissimilar to my daughter turning up with the imaginary axe. 
Um, and of course, they probably did deserve to be sent home with a red note, but no, they were labelled criminal fascists and uh, enemies of, of the state and so on. You get this kind of huge um, division uh, happening. So um, what I think here, the problem is here, and, and this of course is just embodiment of something, that's like a tip of an iceberg because you get, you've got this, if you think about meme culture, if you think about Pepe, uh, Chan culture, uh, and all sorts of trolling, uh, uh, what's the other word? Things like salt mining, grieving. I think that's a really interesting. Um, but these are all associated with the right. And I think that, on, and I used to think this too, so I'm also crit criticizing myself. I, I also moronically wrote that these things were right wing, and now I think that's wrong. Because what that does, in my opinion, is it gives dangerous play and, and, and fun play and humor over to the right, actually. Actually, so while the left or liberals, often or both uh, at times, might to claim that this kind of disruptive play was by nature kind of right wing, fascist, uh, you know, violent, uh, dangerous to be expelled, you know, completely from our discourse. In fact, what that gesture did was it gave away a powerful tool that of play, humour, radicalism, overthrowing, whatever you want to call it, to the discourse of the right where actually, and now we have a uh, paralyzed left liberal culture which hasn't got this radical capacity to disrupt. Uh, a culture which can't play, I would say. Okay, uh, the backdrop for this, I think is really interesting as well. Uh, and here, like, I'll just quickly um, talk about like some work which I think is really interesting and important. I really want to like recommend on this. Uh, and that's like um, two guys, uh, one's a uh, Brazilian writer, Alex Hotchuli, uh, and then um, uh, the German uh, Anton Jaeger. Uh, I think they're brilliant on this and they have this kind of back and forth about what's happened with things being political. Because what they're interested in is how do, what's happened basically since uh, the Cold War is that everything is now political, right? And at a time, I also again was guilty of this, like seeing things and thinking, ah, oh, the politics in that is bad. I want to show the bad politics and, and make it visible so that we can essentially cancel this thing or show how problematic it is. That seemed to me at some point in my life like a good strategy to approach to take, and now I think it was wrong. Um, now, what Alex Hotchuli argues is that basically, since the Cold War, from the period after the Cold War, um, you get a period that he calls post politics, um, where everything gets kind of depoliticized. Right. So you lose the, and of course, I know, I, I'd know i be interested to know what, what you guys think because your context there is so different, but you get a, a period of decades of depoliticization uh, where basically all the major questions are kind of removed from discussions in public life, of the major political questions. Right. Then, uh, and this is where Anton Jaeger's work comes in, then you enter a different period which characterizes today, which Anton Jaeger calls hyperpolitics. Uh, and hyperpolitics is where uh, what Anton Jaeger calls the everywhereness of politics. So now we think politics are everywhere. You know, Alex uh, has written great stuff about Squid Game, for example. It's a perfect example of this, right? As soon as Squid Game came out, uh, it's this endless debate. Is this on our side or their side? What does it mean? Anti-capitalist or pro-capitalist? Metaphor for capitalism? Is it realism? Or, you know, and is it good? Is it okay? And this kind of, um, you know, like search for politics and, and, and argument over where politics is. This is what Anthony Oda calls... Um, the politics, and he says we're in a permanent Dreyfus affair. I think that's a great way of putting it. Uh, but of course, the, con the, the contradiction here, or the problem, the irony, if you want, is that this is the least political, politically useful thing. So we enter a culture of endlessly debating about the politics of things and at the same time losing the capacity for political change. So, um, this, and I think this, this um, really embodies what the sort of dominant liberal culture of today is, is doing. Uh, and I think we can then uh, really, I think a critical part of this is the question of play. Right. And, when, and when I say play, I, I am, and I will sort of say something a little bit about video games, I guess, um, but also the children playing in the playground, but also people uh, saying and doing crazy things in online spaces and having openness of debate and playfully prodding and poking each other and taking the piss out of each other and, uh, you know, ribbing each other and criticizing each other and having a generally uh, a playful time of things. This is what's at stake, I think, today um, with this this question of play and what we see i think is that this as i said this um this problem of uh, our dominant culture thinking that the way to solve this problem is with a hyper politics approach looking back into childhood right from age five 
up until secondary school and up until the childhoods that we all display on Twitter every day, uh, and rooting out the politics of our play, uh, working out uh, and going as far back as you can so that we can banish these problematic things which are caused by, um, by bad play uh, in society today. The problem of this is that is what makes it pleasurable to do, right? So, uh, to go back to, to where I started, when I asked my daughter about this, you know, do you don't want to uh, cut people's heads off with an axe, do you? you know? And she said, no, 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 of course I don't. No, those are my best friends. <laughs> okay, so I said, all right, and so why did, you, uh, why did you say that you would? And she said, because I knew my teachers would be angry. You know, and this is extremely correct, you know, and, you know, they know age five why they've done it, but they've forgotten by age, I don't know, 25. But, of course, I mean, the same thing is true of, like, sending out a naughty tweet into the ether or something. You're, you're anticipating the reaction of the other, and you get a, a validation and a uh, recognition from being told off or whatever. So, like, this is also the, the problem with, you know, not just problems with cancel culture, but problems with the cancelling of cancel culture, you know, because the, there's a desire to be cancelled and so on, and you get this kind of recognition from it. Um, but, um, but of course, the more that space is policed, the more you want to do it, just like a five-year-old girl wanting to get out an axe when she, she didn't have one. And actually, weirdly, I just forgot this, I just remembered it, that year on her Christmas list for Santa, she wrote a real axe. <laughs> so what did it, the incident and the telling off and the red note obviously produce this desire for a kind of transgression or whatever. So in other words, because they're not allowed to do it, right, it comes back in a, and this is where, you know, I would, if I was doing this as a, as a written thing, I would want to think about psychoanalytically what this means, um, not just in terms of repression and uh, the way that that later comes back to kind of um, mess things up, but um, in, in the sense of um, the learning of mastery, right? Like in, in Freud, the classic game is the Fort Dar game, I'm sure you all know, where a child throws something away and wants it brought back, right? It's a sort of pushing and pulling where you learn mastery and you learn how to function in society by practicing these things uh, and seeing what happens. And then you, 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 you learn rules this way. And you, so, so, you know, while, while the, um, you know, so these, these are necessary sort of parts of, of play and of growing up and of learning how to be a sort of subject. And of course, um, so this, this whole logic of, um, uh, let's reach back and politicize and police um, uh, play from the earliest possible point. Um, what that does is it takes away the child's or you know, even adult's uh, ability to go through the processes of play which lead to mastery. And those processes are necessary for a, a, a healthy society to function. This is how you learn to function in social life, by play and by practice and by, learn, and by going through a process which eventually leads you into a, a situation of, of mastery. Um, so, you know, and I think we are uh, seeing in quite um, strange ways this um, this problem of um, this problem of um, people not being permitted to go through this process and I don't know if I quite want to say this but Yes, I, I will. This is also why you get school shootings, um, you know, and why people connect them to video games. Because, you know, uh, you, you have the, the subject of the school shooting has not done the, 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 the connection with video games is kind of fortuitous. I know, like, all games people are sick of this discussion, but just very, very quickly, uh, it's because the process of play has been taken away from the subject that they haven't sufficiently gone through a, a process of maturing that allows them to have mastery and be a subject that has recognition in the world, that they, they, it then comes back in a violent outburst or whatever. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, if you're not allowed to pretend you've got an axe in the playground, you might get one out in real life in your thirties or twenties, you know, because these are these are parts of the process. So the liberal approach is kind of getting it getting it wrong. Um, and also another depressing kind of conclusion I would draw from this is that there's been actually a real shift here in like liberal thinking on the topic, right? So um, since like May '68, uh, there's been a reversal, right? So there, like one of the famous slogans of May '68 was uh, enjoy without limits. So what we need to do as radicals, as, as leftists, is uh, remove the rules so that we can be free and uh, act how we want, be true to ourselves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now there's a perfect reversal of that. Right? The liberal position is now to be perfectly regulated and correct at the level of culture. Right? 
uh, uh, and make sure that we uh, ab abide by the correct rules. But of course, like there's been no, there's been a cultural revolution there in, in a complete reversal without any kind of actual economic or material change or whatever. So it really kind of shows the possibility for a kind of a, a shift at the level of culture without a shift at the level of um, uh, economics or material conditions, which I think is worth just saying as an aside. Um, so anyway, let, let, let me go back then to, um, let, me, let me finish by talking for a few minutes about video games and then just kind of, kind of make a conclusion. Um, I think this question then of, of play is something we really need to get back. And I think that what video games represent is a kind of adult play. And I think they do represent a kind of return to a kind of, uh, well, I mean, just, just a couple of other things about this kind of, um, Actually, no, it's not. Um, but, you know, they, they do represent a kind of desire for mastery, and they are symptomatic, I think, of um, a, this problem also that we don't have. Um, you know, uh, the, the, we're not having the, the play which leads us to, to sort of master our own subjectivity in the actual sphere of life. And video games offer a kind of adult simulation of this. Um, so I think this is also part of the, the, the point. Uh, and again, it's no surprise then that th these kind of games. Um, online games, for example, children's games have also become a site for p political contestation. It's should I let my children use them, or like should we go and uh, you know do some racist trolling in Habbo Hotel, or you know how are we going to manipulate these new spaces of play? So these spaces of play become really, really contentious uh, and and really important, right? And I guess um, what I think we might think about next um, is. Um, what is the role of like this kind of yeah this this world of digital play right in relation to the the kind of what, what happens when we move from the playground to the digital space basically with these kind of things um and in some ways of course um all of these policing points come back in because on the one hand um the game space is regulated and controlled in a way that the playground can't be um, but in another way it's also liberated and dangerous in a way that and, and uncontrollable in a way that the playground can't be or can be controlled. So, um, you know, I, I think um, the, the thing to sort of look for uh, is uh, a play which kind of cuts against this kind of um, approach of like policing and thinking about play. And I'll just think about a few kind of examples of that. Like, for example, um, uh, meme culture would be, I think, an interesting example of this. You get like two kinds of memes without going to like different examples of memes themselves. You get memes which like really kind of validate one position over another, right? And I guess the simplest example of that might be something like um, the one with the expanding brain, and it's like position one, position two, position three, position four. And each of these uh, takes precedence over the next or whatever, and you finish with a, a clear sense of um, things. I would say this is not a, an example of play. This is an example of, yeah, what I'd call maybe something like anti-play or whatever. Um, where, you know, yeah. Whereas, I mean, like, I don't know if you guys have seen this, like, God in Heaven IQ one. Um, I'll just describe it. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, so it's like at the bottom there's an IQ bar. And it goes from like zero to 150 or whatever. And zero to like 20 is like God is a man in the sky. And then like, I don't know, 20 to 50 or whatever, it starts to be like, um, oh no, God uh, is actually a, a concept of belief or whatever. And then uh, like 50 to 100 or 100 and something, it's like uh, uh, God isn't real or whatever. And then once you get to like the end, it's like 150 plus or whatever. It's like God is a man in heaven again, with just this change of, of the word sky for heaven. Uh, so this is like kind of a, a mockery of the other meme, the, the brain expanding meme. But, and what is it's funny is the stupid person and the clever person thinks in the same way. All the midwits in the middle have these like convoluted, highfalutin ideas and uh, you know, really things are quite simple on, on both ends of it. And you actually could find your allies, uh, you know, clever people find their allies in stupid people, the left finds their allies on the right and so on. It's all the midwits in the middle that are fucking things up for the rest of us. Uh, and things are quite are stripped down to a quite simple. Uh, so you 
you don't you precisely don't need an expanded brain right to, to occupy the correct position I, I find this meme a great example of, of play uh, uh, because it's it is uh, actually uh, it's, it's not following the rules you know and, and meme is so interesting in this way it's exactly like uh, you know when you when you when you have a, a meme which repeats itself but it's mimetic it is it precisely following the rules right so it's like those kids playing shops in the playground or whatever and then you get one like this which is like someone turning up with an imaginary axe and it suddenly makes visible the structure that you're in uh, and its limitations and it confronts you with something uh, a kind of makes the politics of the moment visible and forces you in fact to see the limits and the series of desires that, that, that are existing there and the kind of libidinal politics of it all um, so there you go, that's one example. I'll give another example from video games and then I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet for a bit. Uh, I'd say um, an example of uh, uh, this kind of anti-play from the world of video games would be something like Assassin's Creed. Sorry, guys, if you're big fans. Um, but, um, you know, the f I mean, there is a change in, in around, I think, around the third Assassin's Creed. I mean, I can talk to you about Assassin's Creed in, in, in detail, but generally speaking, we, we see these, it's, it's actually kind of as simple almost sometimes as uh, that expanding head meme, in that the game is basically the same at the level of algorithm or structure or whatever, but one of them you play uh, in the, um, you know, as a rebellious uh, sort of, um, you might play as a rebellious uh, 15th century uh, pro-democracy, uh, uh, you know, knight or whatever, and then the next you play as a, a black slave in the uh, in, a, in a different historical period. So the, the historical period has changed, the characters have changed, the identities have changed, and so on. But if you actually just sort of you know covered up the character with your hand, you'd basically be playing the same game again and again, and it just repeats itself. And this is sequel after sequel, um, you know, uh, of of this kind of thing, right? And this is called play, but it's in fact anti-play because it's it's precisely just repeating a series of things. It is exactly as the teachers uh, at my daughter's school would want them to play, right? And then they get the next year group in and they play the same games. They actually do. But obviously that's not how play happens because they haven't played. They've just rep got repeated a pattern. Um, and then, you know, a game uh, like... Um, everything? Has anyone played that? Uh, would be an interesting example, I think, of, of play in this non-formulaic uh, sense, right? And, and another thing, I just I don't want to make one last point. Uh, everything is a game by a guy called Chris O'Reilly. Yeah, uh, uh, where you play as like whatever you bump into. So you might start off as like a tree, uh, and then you like bump into a rabbit, and then you become the rabbit, and then you bump into it. So it's very interesting. It's playing with perspective in a really interesting way. I had another go the other day. Um, uh, it's five years old now, uh, and it's really you can also be a planet, a blade of grass. You can be anything. And um, you know, uh, again, like with a game like Papers Please, whatever, which is another common example of like a radical game these things are like um quite boring at first and this is the thing people say this will be my last point about video games trying to do this um anti-play uh they say well it's not going to be fun right my, my students say this all the time but i love shooting someone in the head with a sniper rifle right i mean so do i but i've done it five million times right so and i'm not saying we shouldn't have this i'm not saying we shouldn't have this i, I don't um you know my my problem with um we, my problem is not, so this is my conclusion, not that we need to stop shooting people in the head with a sniper rifle because it's violence. That, we should, we, we like that aspect of it. Uh, and this is part of how we but we just need to come up with new ways of shooting people in the head with a sniper rifle <laughs> instead of uh, using the same uh, algorithms and the same programs and the same forms of play on repeat. Yeah. Uh, and this way it does become a sort of radical anti-play or whatever, uh, the capacity to disrupt. Yeah. So finally, the vegans pouring milk on things and selfridges are not playing because they're already very sure of what this means, right? And they are using it to didactically and moralistically reinforce a position that already exists. Um, but, and they plan it. And then another vegan thought, let's do some milk going the next week. 
Uh, whereas the uh, idiot right wing chandros pouring milk all over their own faces at the Shia China boots exhibit, they do not know exactly what this means. It is genuinely disruptive and it produces a, a pleasure uh, and an enjoyment and a Really makes politics of its moment really visible. Uh, and I think this is the kind of uh, play that children know how to do and that we are increasingly pressing out. Uh, and I'd like to think at least that through digital cultures such as meme and games, we could like recover and continue to push for this instead of uh, making the mistake of thinking these things are, are bad and complicit with uh, bad politics when in fact they are the kind of thing we politically need. I think I didn't check when I started, but was that the right length? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I will uh, introduce the meeting. And the discussion, of course, uh, is going to happen just after the text talk. So uh, we meet this uh, PhD candidate at the Center for Critical and Cultural uh, Studies at uh, the Faculty of Arts, Charles University. He's uh, most interested in synologies, and I believe his most recent book has been the Center of Industry. So with that, uh, maybe you can add the introduce yourself. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I um, don't have anything to add, but uh, I do have a slight problem because uh, my position here today is a bit different. I, uh, oops. That's okay. We need to press it. Oops. It is a bit weird because uh, I was in fact um, solicited to provide a sort of a short position paper, um, and uh, I'm still on the on the sidekick and the on the robin to how things might be happening. No, 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 you're you're back. So I expect to get you know like slapped by the end of this evening anyway. Um, I'll do a short presentation uh, if I can find it here. And um, which will the challenge for me will most certainly be to, oh, I think this is it. There we go. The challenge for me will most certainly be uh, to actually um, bridge in some way, uh, provide, I suppose, uh, what we shall be call a donkey bridge uh, to, uh, to Alfie's presentation. Anyway, um, so I'd like to pick up perhaps on the, the Alfie angle. Why is, let's say, Assassin's Creed or other similar games, uh, why are they so well who resonate so much? Why do you do it again and again and again? Is this proportion to, you know, kill people in the same way um, uh, kind of with us? And uh, I would like to make sure you know, that there's, if you put in figure games, there's a particular um, kind of circuit which uh, gets employed. And uh, I'm uh, so sort of, I'm speaking about the other hand, a little bit. And with the eventual uh, radiation into uh, virtual reality. So that's, uh, that's kind of it. And um, so I try to speak about uh, the way, uh, I guess, interactivity kind of changes the other visual or audio visual uh, uh, or sort of experience of, 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 of the player. So, um, what is the rubber hand experiment? Let me just, just uh, to, to kind of qualify what I'm saying here. I'm coming at it from uh, the perspective of uh, let's say, uh, Thomas Metzinger, who devotes a lot of his work to the rubber hand experiment, among other things, um, uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, G posits uh, sort of um, a, a virtual body is a type of avatar which she believes is a phenomenal self model, which we are constantly as our brain is actually constantly uh, creating, um, it, it creates the basis for human consciousness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what's interesting is that she actually considers the, uh, the, this phenomenon self model to be the source of, uh, let's say, the limited land, there's this phantom moon effect, and so on. And so this is where the other hand experiment kind of comes in. And I want to use it as a metaphor, although there's a lot of work uh, being done on it currently, I want to use it as a metaphor for, uh, uh, for, for gaming via this remediation. Um, okay, so what is the rubber hand experiment? We see 
uh, we see it here. Um, we have the real hand uh, behind a screen, and there's a fake rubber hand, uh, or which is uh, which the uh, subject is observing. The real hand gets uh, uh, stimulated uh, in the same time as the rubber hand at the same speed. Places. So the circuit here is that we're actually watching uh, the rubber hand be stimulated and we're feeling our own hand being stimulated in the same spaces at the same time. Within an, uh, a minute to a minute and a half, this generates the rubber hand illusion effect. Um, and it's general kind of across the board. Everybody gets this. People actually say that um, uh, they kind of feel their arm, you know, connect from their shoulder to this new rubber hand because they're seeing it stimulated. It becomes theirs. And uh, uh, this for Metzinger is uh, sort of an effect of the phenomenal self model. Um, then, of course, you see the hammer on the right, the rubber hand gets smashed, and you jump because you feel it's your hand, but actually it's not your hand. Um, this is called kind of a proprioceptive shift that you, uh, that you assume the hand to be yours. Um, what's interesting is that uh, with, with remediation, there's been uh, a number of studies. Um, first of all, the rubber hand experiment got um, kind of significant treatment in 1998 at Pittsburgh University, and then the earliest uh, point of remediation I, I, I could I could find was in 2007 at uh, Sun, where the same effect is being done in virtual reality. So already we're kind of, uh, and actually as a as a side note, there's a lot of work being done on this particular uh, effect of remediation, or also in the Czech Republic, uh, Philip Szkła in uh, wrote a 2018 thesis on it, and he has since become associate professor at uh, Masaryk University in Brno, and uh, where he actually adds uh, this spectrum of you know real life to. Um, uh, uh, to augmented reality, to virtual reality, and looks at the effects of the rubber hand illusion experiment. These effects are not only subjective, there's always, as part of the experimentation, there's always uh, surveys to uh, account for the level of um, ownership which the subject feels for the hand, but also on a physiological level, for example, some of the experiments show a decrease in temperature in the real hand, and uh, they consistently show uh, what is called like deep priming, your real hand actually becomes less uh, actionable for you. Um, they run tests on it with like uh, electric currents. So your hand, your real hand kind of shuts off more so during the rubber hand experiment. Now, what is interesting for uh, the, this remediation I keep speaking about is that uh, all these effects are retained kind of across the board with uh, a decrease in uh, the quality. They're not as pronounced as in uh, real life. So uh, I, with the virtual, there's a particular uh, effect or there's a particular aspect to it which can be uh, so, so, uh, sort of uh, uh, which, which, which can be looked for, and that's this level of interactivity. If you have uh, ability to control this this hand, this virtual hand you see, it actually increases your level of ownership, and this is kind of really important for virtual games as audio visual. in VR for like blocks or something. One surprising thing is that if your hand is a block instead of a real hand, and it remains uh, interactive too, it remains responsive to your actions, it's not that big a problem. But if uh, you see a hand, which is um, uh, which is obviously a figural uh, kind of trope for you in the phenomenal self uh, model, um, if it is not uh, interactive, it isn't, if it doesn't react, if it is not responsive to your actions, for example, it can be randomized, the illusion does not take effect as much. So this is very interesting. I mean, if you can control things um, on a screen, whether it's like your hand or, or, or something else, it creates a sense of ownership and it creates... Uh, I kind of want to tease this you know, point that uh, when we play... Uh, for example, AAA games, which are fundamentally figural, especially on like like PS4. I'm not talking so much about strategies, although I would like to end this talk with a kind of questioning of the perspectiveness of, of a strategy, whether it's always retained 
and um, um, Laura kind of had this point that you are, you know, after all in the center. If you're playing civilization, for example, you're after all this kind of like God mode perspective and, and so on. But with figural games, this is really, really, really pronounced. And um, I kind of just want to put this out there really because um, the, the research which is being done is very contemporary, it's very, uh, very current, and I do find that it's not getting perhaps as much attention, although a lot of it is, is being uh, done uh, quite close to us. So, uh, that's just kind of a prompt for perhaps uh, subsequent uh, research. And to fulfill my duties as a uh, sidekick, I'd perhaps like to kind of uh, open up uh, with a question to Alfie, if that's okay. Oops, sorry, yeah. <clears throat> I have a terrible habit of speaking close on the mic. It's, 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 I don't know why I do it, but I do. Um, I think I found it really interesting what you, what you spoke of. Um, one thing which kind of came to me, this question of play, particularly, let's say, in the you know, Euro-Atlantic Anglophone uh, scene today, um, it, it, it reminded me of perhaps Mark Fisher's framing of the Vampire Castle, where play is somehow policed, it's somehow um, uh, you know, uh, uh, being, being stigmatized uh, for, for various reasons. And versus his, um, you know, final publication, Prosimus' publication of Acid Communism, where, in a way, I, I want to ask whether you might see, um, sort of in this Fisher's frame, Acid Communism as a, as a reclaiming of a certain point in time when play was possible and, and play was experimental and, um, in a way, disruptive while remaining productive. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, it's really interesting. I also want to say something about your thing, um, but 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 you know, I think that's a good um, a good suggestion. Uh, you know, it'd be it's yeah, it'd be nice if people did more of uh, using Mark Fisher properly for his ideas instead of being like, "Ooh, Mark Fisher." Um, but um, but you know, yeah, this is this is uh, this is right. Um, you know, the, there is this kind of policing of play that's probably historical. I mean, you know, it, it's the same with the example of like. Yeah, it, it, I was just reminded there about like when they play families and stuff, you know, it's like you, you can't say to them, well, why don't you get a wife instead of a husband? You, you've got to leave them to do that, you know, and, and, and then eventually they, they, you know, if, if family structures change or whatever, then they won't replicate the same structures down the line. You can't sort of insert it, you know, consciously. Uh, into the child's play space, and I think that's some of that in in, in acid communism and uh, and and what um, what this idea this idea is about. So, yeah, no, I mean, I I, I said so I just and I took this idea on like because of anecdotes of things that happened in the last year or two, but uh, and I haven't probably thought about writing about it, but this is probably a really interesting way to go, I'd say, and I, I do think it's. Um, it's a question of communism because it's a question of public space as well and play in the private space of the digital world uh, versus the you know supposedly public space of you know a state school playground or whatever but also you know where does this play take place is it, and, and and what how does that relate to its capitalization or its com its potential communism and, and and so on and i think that's that's really important because yeah i'd say that the uh, the policing of it presses out the possibility for solidarity and collaboration and collectivity to emerge. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, and what I want to say about this is just so interesting, the hand thing. And, and I, it's a totally separate conversation, I guess, but I know you, people are interested in VR as well. And I always found it instinctively as like somebody who played video games from like probably, I think I was seven when I got Sega Game Gear. You know, that was my first. You know, and it, it's really not, uh, and, but, but all this talk of like immersion and the power of immersion, um, well, we, I, my, always, my, impre my um, sort of instinctive feeling is that from a gamer's perspective, we've been immersed for like decades now. So this doesn't necessarily add much when you suddenly have the headset and so on, the, all this kind of talk about the metaverse. If a, ga if a gamer goes in the metaverse, you just think it's shit, you know, well, it is shit, but, but I mean, even, it's even shitter if you're a gamer compared to if you're not, because you're, you're, you're used to these method, these structures, of it. and this kind of replacement of the hand with the block is a great example of that. It's not actually anything to do with realism. It's some other feedback loop that makes you immersed. And, 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 and therefore, you know, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because the way it's going towards like VR and, and uh, metaverse and realism within those things is not actually, that's kind of missing the point of how these things work on you psychologically, I think. So, and I think that's really shown in there.
There's one thing here which is interesting because um, this actionability in the virtual space or, uh, has to do with ownership, and this is kind of um, uh, uh, con conclusively established. And I I'm just wondering whether perhaps uh, this, you know, this, the toxicity of the Twitter sphere, et cetera, et cetera, has to do with exactly, you know, pressing the buttons of society in a way, giving me some sort of ownership over it. And I'm just wondering whether, um, you know, the right perhaps um, is is using language for the proper purposes, but by improper means. It's like, you know, people who have trouble interacting, let's say, with the socius, you know, just pressing buttons to actually get some sort of reaction. Mm. I don't know, just a hypothesis. Mm. But you can win like Tekken by, by doing that. <laughs> no, actually, you can't beat someone good. No, I know. I think it's an interesting way of putting it. I mean, but but I think on the other hand, you don't want to, you don't want to like, um, you don't want to say, um, oh, this is just mindless. You know, because I do think there's an instinctive um, gesture being made, which is also constructive, even though it's 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 like, you know, it's not quite the same. You know. For example, there is a difference, isn't there, between going to on, on a and throwing a brick through the window of a, the money shop on on, a, on 2010 riots or something, and going to an art project and pouring milk on your face. There are different kinds of rebelliousness. You know, I don't know. It's it's uh, anyway. It's, it's interesting because I think I, I think that it does work. The analogy you're making, like, why isn't there a button here for what I want to do? And that that's what it represents. So you, you're sort of there's a frustration. It's a symptom mm -hmm. of that frustration. Uh, and so yeah, it's a question of uh, yeah. I don't know how how do we do something that the controller isn't allowing us to do? Yeah, I think that's great. Great way of putting it. Yeah, great. Thank you for starting the discussion already, but uh, maybe there's uh, in audience some questions. Hi, this is really, really interesting. I'm going to take a couple of seconds to sort of uh, warm up to my question because I'm mainly after uh, responding to you when you, uh, I think, uh, sort of in a very general sense, accurately describe this sort of uh, the seriousness, seriousness and maybe the sanctimoniousness of a lot of uh, of, of liberalism generally. So I have a background in like the environmental humanities and um, last fall I taught uh, Introduction to the Environmental Humanities. First book on the agenda is called Bad Environmentalism, a uh, book by Nicole Seymour, I can heartily recommend. It's basically a response to this idea that environmentalism comes in a couple of different registers, doom and gloom or like holier than thou sanctimoniousness, right? Which is really unpersuasive, which is inc incredibly like exclusionary as well. So the whole book is a kind of um, a call for a more diverse, uh, affective uh, register to develop, be developed in um, environmentalism, uh, and a register that includes um, humor, comedy, irony, ambivalence, queerness, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, and I, I think like generally, uh, so and then kind of the second part of my background is in game studies, right? And so uh, looking at climate change video games, some of the very first titles that you come across are pretty didactic. So in that sense, yeah. like it completely accords to what uh, uh, Nicole Seymour is saying there. And so in my research, I've then kind of looked more closely at dark play or transgressive plays, what I guess the labels would be in uh, game studies. Uh, specifically uh, uh, oil-themed games, right? Like, why do people want to play as oil tycoons? <laughs> because it's certainly a really, because uh, it's cool to see like, numbers go up, right? Like, make more money. It's a very liberal thing. I yeah. don't think we should deny that. But then um, I want to kind of um, uh, ask you maybe for a bit of elaboration when you say that, because um, uh, you, you mentioned a, a lot of different examples, right? Uh, your, uh, your daughter in, uh, in, in, in the playground, but also uh, towards the very end there, uh, vegans pouring out milk in the supermarket versus um, uh, uh, alt-right boys uh, chugging milk or whatever, right? And your um, uh, point there was that vegans pouring out milk in the supermarket sort of already know what it means, uh, to which I would argue like, but don't the alt-right boys also kind of know what it means? Like they both, I'm not sure that that's the, the best example of something that would be uh, real play, you know, as opposed to anti-play. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I had a, all oh, right. And then, so I guess my final more general question is like, uh, when you talk about play, are you talking sort of about like the spirit of play, like the spirit of rebelliousness, or are we really talking about 
uh, sort of actual like gameplay that happens in communities, right? Because I think in, in a lot of uh, scholarship on play and games, there's a, there's a little bit of a, uh, a gap there between like the kind of play that we idealize and that we, we, we sort of like, that's almost like a, uh, I don't know, yeah, like this, I, I'm just going to say spirit of play versus actual gameplay. And then towards the very end there, you said that um, uh, play can't be prompted. Like, to, how is prompting the same as policing or is it completely different? But like, uh, just to sort of uh, push back a bit on the language that you use there, since I, uh, since I, yeah, I guess I disagree, I think that like play can be prompted. But yeah, it's different, I guess, from policing. Uh, I don't know, I just kind of want to put it out there to, to yeah, yeah. process the thing. Yeah, sure. No, uh, okay, so firstly, I, 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 do, I, didn't, I don't think I meant to say prompt, prompted. I think I just meant it can't be policed. So, uh, no, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I guess you could um, prompt um, kids to have more progressive play, but I still wouldn't want to do that, actually. I'd, I'd still consider that a kind of policing, um, you know, to say, well, why don't you, you know, experiment a bit with your gender when you're playing that, you know, it's just the, the, that's not, the, uh, for me, that's, that's when it's already, it becomes too political, it's become too political already, and then you uh, are guiding uh, a play into a certain channel. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, 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 you do see, um, yeah, like like cookie clicker or something. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you do see that, don't you? I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess. I, I guess. I, I think what what um, my feeling about it, which I don't know if it's it's right, is that um, you know. Uh, yeah, pro I, I, that's why I said I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with the word prompt, really, because, you know, things are, the play is prompted by everything, you know, it's prompted by everything they see around them, it emerges from their environment, right? So, you know, I think we should um, change the material conditions of our environment and play will follow, not the other way around. Um, so, uh, you know, you'll see uh, less, because like you said about capitalism simulators, you know, the, 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 the games that we play, you know, those things are so pleasurable and those things are so r repeated from childhood on because this is the society we live in, right? So I think it goes the other way. And, and this is also why uh, video games uh, designers who want to be uh, communist or socialist are, are up against it in a sense because it doesn't work that way around. You don't create a communist game and suddenly you've got a revolution. That's not how it works, right? So we, we where there is a kind of impotence on the game designing left because I don't think that's how social change will happen. Uh, and there's really interesting then about the climate change thing, like how does one deal with this? Like, and I don't know, that's a huge question about what the politics of games are and, and stuff, but like what should we do with climate change in games, for example? I mean, I don't know, I mean, is it the job of games to uh, solve or push an agenda of climate change? Also, games are environmentally damaging for the most part. I'd say, you know, if you want to be a climate change and games person, surely like the way to go is like not use a PlayStation and like, you know, use uh, stripped down software and pixel art and, you know, ha have a better, you know, approach to the, uh, the material conditions of, you know, and think about like what factories were the parts of your computer made in and how many, you know, uh, unemployed Chinese workers, underemployed, precarious Chinese workers were part of the bits of metal that are in the machine that you use to make the game. I think that's how to think about games and climate change, not like, you know, should we have some like green imagery or whatever in the game? Um, but like, um, the, the really, um, in, I, I thought your question about the, um, the, uh, the writing side is extremely interesting and really important. Um, so, you know, I admit that I just used the example because I wanted a, a right-wing example because part of the problem is the liberal and the leftist desire to see those types of what I think is can often be radically disruptive moments as right-wing, right? And I'd say they are co those moments are being, those those kinds of radicalism are being more successfully co-opted by the right, as I think Vit was saying, than, than they are by the left. So, you know, I, I definitely think it's helpful just just, just that um, for the sake of argument, to, to draw an example from from there um, of something that you know, if you say that type of play is right wing, what you do is you you distance yourself from a type of play that you actually need to have, right? Um, so, but, but again, and then, and then lastly, on the, on the two milks, I mean, just for the sake of, uh, it's a fun thing to talk about. Uh, I think there's a difference because I think. Um, 
I think the excess, you know, it's the excessive quality. Like you, because some people uh, on the on the right, uh, the art project did loads of anti-play examples. Like they just turned up and said, kek, 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 or like you know, brought a Pepe flag. Now, I think that's that's not uh, play. That's the same as the left is going. He will not divide us, right? They both do that. The, the milk thing, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's extremely excessive, it's extremely funny, and it seems to sort of shape uh, and make visible the, 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 um, the politics of division that characterises the event itself. It seems to make it impossible just to carry on with the left versus right thing, because you've been sort of co-opted libidinally into an, and, and it's suddenly it's, it's visible. You can't, the kids can't play shops after the imaginary acts has come out, right? You can't go back to your structure once the, the milk's been poured. And whereas I don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that, you know, putting some milk in Salt Bay's restaurant has that effect at all. It, it seems to reinforce the divide. Meat eating, you know, when Piers Morgan or whatever goes on and eats a steak in front of a vegan, and you've got Piers Morgan and a vegan, you know, you've got your salt based steak eating, money wasting capitalist meat eater, and your milk throwing vegan. It's extreme, it's, it's, it, it, it um, solidifies the divide. Whereas the other one, it, it, it makes the politics visible and makes it possible to think outside of left right divides. And that's why I chose that meme of the, you know, the IQ with the two sides and, and also the example from the right being a progressive play or whatever, just because I think that's what the power of play can do. It can, it can operate across those left right divides and those kind of things. I hope that's like part of an answer. I don't know, but I think those are really interesting questions. Anyway. I, I maybe like to jump in sort of because um, Alfie did mention uh, the Freudian example of uh, his, uh, I believe it was grandson who was playing the Ford Dow game. And I just want to maybe qualify that as far as Ford was concerned, like the Ford Dow game was, uh, so he was throwing a, a toy outside of a crib and then like roping it back and there was Ford, which is like there and then back. And apparently Ford's idea was that because this started, this, uh, this started happening once uh, the boy's mother started leaving and it was his way of actually gaining control over a situation which was beyond his control. So he was like, even though his mother left, he at least had this toy, which he had control of when it yes, leaves and great. when it comes back. And I'm just kind of wondering, um, or, or I'm just try, kind of trying to like, you know, inject that into our conversation here, that it, a play does seem to actually resolve uh, issues and problems. Uh, and it, there is this, you know, cathartic element to play. And it becomes very hard to tell people that like they can't play what they want to play at. Because, you know, from a therapeutic or, or sort of a subjective, affective level, it's, 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 it's very hard to do that. Of course, there must be limits, but where do you set them up? And now, you know, this is the conversation we're having. And I just want to kind of like, you know, slide that in, that play is not a priori, a left-right political um, a kind of engagement. It's, you know, it is subjective and personal and uh, psychological. Yeah, and universal, I think I'd just say that. It's, it's universal. And it speaks across identity divides. Also, it honestly... to do with gender or class or race or mm, whatever. You, you made the point of your, your daughter kind of upping the ante, you know, like she was no longer satisfied with the rules of the game, so she kind of like took an axe to it and like changed the rules of the game. And I find that that this is actually really an important part of play, which we're definitely not getting in contemporary, you know, virtual like AAA gaming, which is just constantly the same. You can't ever change the rules of the game, so to speak. You can only get locked in into this kind of like control ASMR, you know. My life is like it's, you know, it's all over, but when I play this game, everything's under control because I know, you know, the procedurality of it. I know, like, what what's going to happen if I do this and this. So um, I, I, I do find that kid, children's games are actually, like, real games because they actually resolve real issues. Whereas, you know, our gaming is kind of like um, ASMR, I would say. Okay. Well, some more positive uh, feedback or questions? Yeah, I would like to maybe continue with the question of uh, disappearing the left or losing the ability to uh, to for political disruption. Maybe uh, the left is more invisible now because all this uh, uh, I don't know LGBT uh, communities and uh, other leftists moved out from the like uh, commercial platforms. 
and uh, they are not trying to compete uh, or even uh, uh, as you talked uh, about this uh, wish to cut heads <laughs> or something like that there is some oedipus complex with uh, people which are vulnerable they often have a difficult uh, relation to society and they are hiding if you are uh, uh, trying to talk to them and talk uh, some kind of uh, different way than them they are defending and they are really uh, really locked in uh, some uh, like uh, hidden structures and uh, maybe uh, there is a similar uh, attitude to for gaming because the gaming is uh, uh, more like creative, maybe more linked to real life patterns. Mm -hmm. So they are not the easy games like uh, cognitive automation of uh, some simple things. They are more uh, complex, maybe uh, linked to creative patterns like uh, programming, cliff coding, and there is a whole uh, like uh, domain of this. Uh, uh, leftist attitudes which which are uh, hidden which is uh, uh, like more fragile uh, mm. and we should look for this disruptive patterns uh, in this area which is not uh, really easy to uh, to oversee or what do you think yeah no i think i agree with that i think i agree with that i think the yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, again, this is a big, big question about where the, the place of the left is now. Um, but um, yeah, the question of how to unite um, groups or, or, or dissident energy or radical energy, which is channeled into other things, um, you know, like. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I just I, I agree with you. I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, but, but I suppose, I suppose play, you know, um, because my experience is like these people do not uh, play a thousand times uh, the same game, but yeah. maybe more programming a game in open source software. Yeah, and, yeah, I guess, yes, and yeah, never yeah, play yeah. it or maybe play it with five friends. And, yeah, uh, like this. yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, obviously, the, the like with social media, though, the idea of this space as a place where people could come together and form new kinds of community and democracy doesn't seem to be what's actually happening, right? It seems more divisive. But, you know, I nevertheless, I, I, sort, I don't know, I think that... Um, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, th this is another. Th uh, yeah, I think I think there's something in this actually. I mean, you know, the 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 conception. One thing I've always felt is, and not not just recently. I mean, one the narrative I suppose is that gamers used to be, um, you know, American and European men and Japanese, uh, usually of a certain age. You know, there's all the stereotypes living in their mum's basement or whatever. But it's actually been many, many decades since this was true. You know, spaces of, of gaming are not just also full of women, but also trans people, LGBTQ plus activists. You know, the game space is actually extremely diverse. Right. So and so the play there is operating in a way which is countercultural and so on. But the problem is they doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to help unify those things. So you have like individual pockets where, you know, you've got your, um, you know, one group pr pushing a certain identitarian agenda here and another group here. Uh, you know, it seems to. So, you know, it's not it's just not true anymore that gaming is the, the place of, you know, you know, uh, of, of men from the Western world. It's actually an extremely, and, and the, so yes, I think there's an extremely big potential in the fact that all those diverse groups of people are in this big pool of libidinal mess together. You know, play is full of desires, drives, you know, emotions, affects. You know, this is just a simple, like, sort of, you know, uh, way of arg answering the question, but surely there's a potential to harvest all of that energy through those mechanisms and communities full of desire and drive and affect and create uh, the missing left out of it. Uh, so yes, I think games can play that, a part of that role. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I feel like the conversation has gone round to, uh, yes, yeah, so a topic that I also think care much about and 
is, uh, is really important, and that is uh, player communities. And then I also kind of want to introduce the uh, notion of trust, since I think your daughter captured it wonderfully when she said, yeah, I can pull my axe out because these are my friends, right? Ultimately, generally, you play with your friends, uh, and that is exactly, I think, where, uh, on the left at least, you find the most uh, transgressive uh, libidinal play, right? So I think this uh, the idea that the left, I mean, I agree with you that there is a general sort of perception of this, but I think it doesn't quite um, uh, like gel with reality just because there is a lot of uh, really transgressive uh, uh, geeky play uh, in, in these spaces, but I think um, the the freedom to pursue those uh, to sort of like explore those urges or to play those characters uh, is incredibly tied up with do I trust this community? Uh, and I can only speak from uh, personal experience in the sense that like I get uh, all of the weird like love stuff that I get up to if if I if I wouldn't like trust the, my fellow players or the, the 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 game facilitators or whatever, there would not be that kind of freedom to uh, play really nasty characters and to really sort of try and uh, yeah to sort of explore um, questions with more uh, with more ethical sort of freedom and unpredictability. Yeah, I totally agree with that, and and you know, it just makes me want to add um, very quickly what to what you said. Just that it's interesting, isn't it? That play with your friends thing's interesting. It's interesting how much of social media life, especially Twitter, is playing with your enemies. Uh, you know, it's like uh, it's it's precisely not a, an atmosphere of trust. It's the the pleasure is like you know put and trolling and they, those phrases for like grieving and salt mining, which come from the games community but are now part of the wider online discourse. It's precisely playing with your enemies. There's this strand, and then there's this other strand which you find in different kinds of communities, which is playing with your friends, and that's really interesting. I think it's a different structure. Um, and then um, the other thing I was very quickly going to say just about what you last said. It's, it's very interesting that in the 90s, if you read articles in the news from the 90s about like dungeons, online gaming dungeons and stuff, like the shit that was going on in there is pretty transgressive. And, and some of it's really on the edge. There's like even, you know, there's lots of people of different ages, let's say, uh, in these um, dungeons online, you know, uh, and, and most of the media reporting for it is really positive. It's like people are experimenting with their identities, their gender, their sexuality. They're getting to experience different role playing aspects and so on, even when it's quite violent and in some cases illegal. Um, whereas if you look at the news coverage of it now, it's like we must stop that from happening. You know, and I, I don't know, I don't think, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but there's definitely been a big political shift in, in those kind of communities and, and the experiences of them and our impression of them and so on. Anyway, I think that's, that's a great point. I just want to um, maybe give us sort of a dichotomy here. I, it seems that there's um, a, a drive towards like a purity in gaming, and I just I think it needs to be mentioned maybe like um, uh, Gamergate obviously being uh, fundamentally like an affair based on policing and on uh, ostracization and marginalization and abuse, uh, online abuse, um, particularly targeted women in the uh, gaming industry. But uh, it's I think it's necessary to actually uh, speak about the fact that um, yes, we have this you know great explosion, this capability of of indie games kind of you know giving voice. Um, to let's say libidinal urges, to framing communities of trust, which are able to to play, but then there's this tremendous backlash against this exact thing that people would actually express themselves and their identities and their communities and their lifestyles via games. Uh, so I, I think this is just like really important to to keep in mind that there is you know a drive from certain segments of the population or online whatever communities to actually kind of like make gaming puerile you know and um, whether it's coming from the left or whether it's coming from the right i think it's equally toxic thank you <clears throat> maybe time for one more one or two questions Okay, um, you talked, maybe you've already touched on this, about um, the reason why games are being policed in a different way. So you talk about like the 90s compared to now. Mm -hmm. And obviously what has happened is like there's a contracting of the sphere of like political contestation, like the terrain 
where like proper political contestation is supposed to happen yeah. because of financialization of everything and everything. Um, but my question was, shit. <laughs> <laughs> my question was, fuck. No, I mean, I think that's, um, it is, I, I probably okay. could have, yeah, okay, go on. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, no, actually, you, well, I was going to say, um, I, I, did, I would, would like to make the connection you just made, actually, that, um, you know, one thing that's going on here is we are already getting sucked into this debate about our games left and right. How do they see what the left right? And part of what I wanted to say in the talk was that this isn't what we should be talking about, you know. Um, so, you know, because I think, you know, as you were saying, uh, you know, this is obscuring. Uh, and I, I really like the arguments of... Um, Jacques Rancière, you know, what, what happens is we, uh, when the left dies or whatever, and this is partly your question, what the problem actually is, is we lose the ability to know what matters and to, and to, to pick the right battles and to, to discuss the things that count, right? And I think this is also happening with this over-politicization of everything. That's what I was talking about. With but the in Anthony a way, it's Hager. like not political at all. It's not exactly. It's completely opposite. It doesn't matter. Policing, yeah. And actually the political thing yeah. is the play itself. Yeah. But the play, you know, as in like this embrace of contradiction or like, uh, entering into some kind of universal, like exploding the kind of paradigm that you have already. And that exactly. usually or would, in an ideal world, happen within a terrain of politics. And yeah. so, yeah, but, the, but, but politics has become this like policing or trying to insert, like doing this politics is downstream from culture things, so trying to yeah. insert politics, but this is precisely preventing politics from happening. Yes, and that makes me have an answer to the prompt thing, because I, I think even if you try to prompt, uh, you'll do even, I, I actually, I'm, I'm the most guilty because I wrote a book about uh, how the left can, <laughs> to prompt leftist gaming, and I now think that, that was probably the wrong approach, because you just get sucked into the same thing. What you're actually doing there is policing the field and saying, is it this, is it this, what politics is it, what happened with Squid Game, you know, whereas, yeah, where the politics actually happens is in the play itself not in the, you know, politicization of the debate around it and so on. So I think but that's part of it. But you were saying before that, like, oh, you have these socialist game designers and that's a dead end because you can't influence, like, material conditions through play. But you actually, in a way, you're saying that you can. So it's a different from what, you know... It's just, a different kind of play. Yeah, it's yeah. a different kind of play. Yeah. Or it's like, it yes. obviously it's difficult if you're trying to create some kind of socialist thing, then obviously if you're making a game and everything's capitalism, then you're influenced by, you know, having to enter in this oppositional ideology of capitalism. But, like, the game itself construct can can inter, interplay with subjectivity to get us to confront our material conditions yes actually. i think so i think so and that's i guess what i was trying to think about was with this word anti-play and play or whatever maybe i need some other terms but like how to like pick out some way of describing these moments where it's not about saying uh, this is progressive because it x or whatever but like here's something actually happening you know something where the the kinds of play that's happening there is shifting subjectivity or transformative in some way that can be you know, useful and 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 necessary. Whether and that the question of whether it's left or right is uh, absolutely irrelevant in that in those moments. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Uh, I don't know if this is the message we want to end up with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if there is still uh, one question, we have some time before another panel. If not, it's uh, completely fine. And I, uh, I can uh, recommend again to stay with us you, uh, even um, uh, until the evening and we will go to Laika to have maybe some more um, communal yeah, great. Uh, discussion. Yeah, I'll definitely join and yeah. love to talk to you more about all this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for, uh, for thank you Vitek and for, thank you Alfie, and we will reconvene in like half an hour, really uh, four four p.m. And uh, there's going to be some combat, uh, maybe between like refusing combat and between fighting on our part. So uh, come come again on four p.m. And thanks to our guests. We're joining uh, for the afternoon session, sorry. <laughs> okay, nothing's happened probably. They like gratification. Anyway, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome here Total Refusal, Robin Kleingo. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know German. And Jona Kleinlein. Yeah, was that okay? Yeah, thank you. From, from Total Refusal. I'm gonna I'm gonna read the the annotation because uh, I don't intend to misinterpret you. 
total refusal is our pseudo Marxist media girl that appropriates video game spaces. For some reason, spaces are with big, with the capital S. Next to artistic and educational projects, they are theoretically interested in underlying ideologies that are baked into gameplay and narrative structure. And you will present your work and also give insight into your practices and thought, is what it says. So I hope that's correct. Thank you so much for coming from Vienna. And yeah, uh, enjoy. Yeah, thanks for having us and for inviting us. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, we will just uh, tell you a little bit what we do, and um, yeah, so we hope it's something new for you. Uh, but so for you, it will be repetitive again, <laughs> but I think you can survive. Yeah, so uh, we're totally refusal, but it's not only us, it's like a collective of six. Um, and we basically, how we would describe ourselves as like um, some sort of like, or that we intervent in video games instead of like creating or like, um, 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 uh, work with that that way, and we up, try to upcycle them, mostly um, AAA titles like where the big money and the big like the big games are, and um, basically um, we use different tools um, to to do that, which is like sometimes even writing about. Um, like theory, but mostly it's um, some sort of like uh, rec screen recording, editing, doing essay films, um, performances, uh, art installations, trying to utilize the video games in like a different way, maybe they, how they were intended. And yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, of course, it's it's a lot about, uh, I think it's, it, it's kind of maybe in good. Um, a uh, good connection to uh, the to Alfie's uh, to do discussion like that we just had because it's a lot about how to play games differently or how to counter a game and stuff like this so maybe there you can relate um so how what does that mean and uh, what do we actually do i think we just show you some examples of uh, of the things that we that we do and everything basically started with um, um a thing that called operation chain walk and it, it started like this. There's, this is like me and, and Leonhard in the center of the stage. And we um, like to play video games. Okay, so and um, we played um, a game that is called uh, The Division. It's like a Ubisoft title, which plays in Midtown Manhattan. And um, as we had before, uh, it's it has this it, like it's. I don't know if any of you played this actually, but. It, it has a very repetitive uh, um, 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 basic narration. It's like all these Ubisoft games, which kind of repeat itself. Like they have this, um, um, yeah, this basic uh, um, um, yeah, um, kind of st structure, and it really gets boring after a while. But it really has a crazy, wonderful sc uh, uh, scenery. It plays in Midtown Manhattan, and they have remodeled whole Midtown Manhattan for the game. So while playing, we kind of more and more um, forgot about the game and the quests and everything, and more focused on the architecture that is actually represented in the game, because this is, is really amazing. and. Um, Somehow we had the idea it would be fun to, because we're both architecture enthusiasts and I studied urban anthropology. So we had the idea, yeah, let's make a, 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 like a city tour, like a guided tour through the game. And let's talk about the architecture and let's use it as an architecture model. And that's really amazing because, I mean, you can really talk about many things there in, in the game because it's like a huge landscape. It's rebuilt, but it's not one-to-one, -one, but it, it has many similarities to reality, but it's, of course, a different version of it. So we developed a tour where we go from one um, um, part of the map to the very other one um, stopping at various land landmarks and talk about urbanist um, different urban theories and um, the architectural history of the city and there's a lot of modernist architecture up until the Trump Tower which is like the the end of the tour and um, yeah that's that's how everything kind of started and we had great fun developing this and then basically it's a tour so we sometimes invite people on the stage and we do this live but if we also basically just for showing it to people we recorded it and we made a like a short film out of it and then it kind of 
ventilated it, it, it was f f to our complete surprise it was really kind of successful and people really like to watch it apparently um, so it kind of happened that we became filmmakers and also it happened that we kind of were more and more engaged with this question of how to what you can actually use video game spaces for for, for other things than maybe they are intended or how can you actually recycle maybe uh, these absurd resources that are in games like with, with so many people being involved in creating them and um, it's actually kind of an absurdity that you only use them as a backdrop for for some shooting so that's how we um started and um yeah, somehow in the beginning, it, it, it we really had a, it was a lot of a pacifism also because of course it uh, a lot of again the proposed gameplay is, is is militarized gameplay. So if you if you want to do something else in the games, then you you kind of become a pacifist and we um, so we called ourselves uh, the, the digital disarmament movement and yeah so a kind of pacifist start which was kind of easier at the time and um, yeah so we came up with many more ideas and then we joined more and more people so also Jonah and the others joined um, the team so that's that's kind of the start the start. Yeah, so as Robin already said, like, obviously in a shooter you're limited to what you can peacefully do. Like you still, like you can't even drop your weapon. You you, you can use it as a pointer for others. For example, use uh, the crosshairs for showing like close-ups of the um, facade of the skyscraper. Um, and like exploring this kind of limitation in like a different work is uh, the circumventing of uh, the circle of death, which is from the same year, and uh, in, is uh, made in, uh, what's that? Uh, it's Sudden Strike 4. It's Sudden Strike 4, yeah. So it's this like Second World War game where you play like uh, Nazis against uh, Soviet Russians, and you have this um, like pretty like strategic uh, top-down um, game. Um, and it basically like, those 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 soldiers are really de dehumanized and and the tanks and like you they basically can't do anything else than if they look at each other they start shooting like you they can't stop shooting um if they if they face each other they shoot and if they stand still they shoot so the only thing you can do peacefully is keep them uh moving and not let them face each other <laughs> uh which basically turns into this like so, some sort of dance um which is um, ingrained into this like snowy landscape. So the longer this circle goes on, this dance where they circle each other, the more uh, it becomes some sort of drawing, um, which I can quickly show like a tiny clip of it. Yeah, it's fun also because of the soundtrack. Yeah, he gets a point. It's, 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 it's less like playing uh, the game than, than kind of playing with the algorithm and kind of uh, yeah, showing also these absurdities that, that are inscribed into the, yeah. the algorithms. Which like the soundtrack is basically this like constant clicking and <laughs> triggering of this like voice lines that you constantly have in those strategy games, but you don't realize it because you're so immersed in those but if you just displace it you have this like su absurd soundtrack of this like voice lines that you constantly repeat and of course it's like a humorist approach as well um to this the next um film that we did um is called uh, how to disappear and really follows the same basic idea it which is um asking questions of uh yeah um yeah pacifist 
possibilities within uh, within vi war video games. So this uh, is a film that we shot entirely in Battlefield 5, and it's really a, a piece uh, like an anti-war movie in the truest sense, as it explores also the story of um, of deserters and the history of running away from war, like well, which is uh, which is something that we found really interesting also to um, to tell because. Um, yeah, it's kind of worth mentioning that, I mean, most, I mean, with really a few exceptions, most games and uh, most films as well, and basically how war basically or history is told is, of course, uh, through the perspective of perspective of people that were willing to fight the wars and the people that ran away and didn't participate uh, is something that uh, at least I have never learned anything about in school. Um, so, and there's really a lot to, to talk about it as it really shaped how societies and uh, the military could function so that people couldn't run away. I mean, it's kind of absurd, right? Um, so telling this story and at the same time, we really tried out how uh, peaceful intervention would work within this game, or, which is actually really just a battlefield. So if you try to leave it, uh, the game would execute you. Um, so how can you be disobedient? How can you um, not follow this logic? How can you? We also tried a lot uh, to um, to play with other people, basically trying them to um, yeah to to take a break and to to it, how how are the options for yeah. um, for that effectively trolling them but like <laughs> in, in an online of course like you you have in an online shooter game you have those like this this um people that just join into your art performance like they don't they just accept that there's something happening and and people are just like it's kind of this fluent thing it's like a pub it's almost like a public space in a way um, through that the attention span is way shorter but it's still there and uh, but obviously there's a lot of limitations like here you can see our like the protagonist on the picture he has like um hammer in his hand and that's the only the, the most peaceful uh tool that you can hold because you have to hold something which is like maybe there's a band-aid or something that you can hold but as a tool yeah yeah and, and there's no possibility to even communicate with the others and uh with the other team and you cannot like hold up your hands and there, there's really it's very very limited and we had to film it all in this battlefield um arenas yeah. Um, being shot so often during shooting this film and, and yeah, it's, it's quite it was quite a challenge so like um, if we if we don't show like a clip for every movie like obviously on our website and stuff you can watch that because we don't we have like many more to show <laughs> so we're just going yeah through uh, and like um, this is another example of like you uh, worked in Tom Clancy's The Division with like this when uh where i wasn't part of but it's like this this really great project that i really like um is that you basically came across this like uh, roadblock in the game while playing and you use because you can just it's like destructive like you can use it and shape it with like gunning it down basically like shooting on it and you started like shaping this like um block and um, and basically resculpturing it in the real world as a concrete block, like the destructed version, and um, and it became this kind of some sort of like monument for like um, this like peaceful intervention in in a way. I mean, it wasn't like peaceful in that way, but became uh, through that it became this like monument for uh, yeah. And we also like what you said um, that basically, you know, the, the destruction that that you cause in the game, it's always reversed. Mm. So uh, the next time you meet this concrete block, it's again um, untouched, and uh, transferring it to reality yeah. was kind of a way to preserve this and to um, um, create memory or <laughs> something like this. So um, yeah, and um, maybe one last thing uh, for for this. Um, um, yeah, a, a, a kind of pacifist uh, series that we developed is, or you want to say something for this? No. no. Um, is, uh, is something that is called um, Swings Don't, Don't Swing. <clears throat> and this is filmed in uh, the game um, Tom Clancy's Wildlands. Again, a Ubisoft title where you play an American agent, basically, um, going to a place which is Bolivia, and it's kind of portrayed as a failed state, and you enter there to yeah, um, make order as an American agent is really kind of um, um, playing 
American, US American interventionalism in the game, but it's, of course you are the good guy. And, and in the game, um, there is um, what we found so funny is, of course, we always uh, visit uh, the playgrounds in the games. Um, and see how they work. And in this case, it's specifically funny. Maybe you can show the video. Um, because, um, so it's basically an installation with uh, where you see the, those four videos. And on the videos, you see um, us trying to play on the playgrounds within the game, which is really absurd. Maybe you can jump a bit um, and to the point because of course it's it's totally dysfunctional in the playground you cannot really use it and all the tools are not really made for for really playing that we try to shoot the ball into the um into the goal which is the only way how you can actually play football um but maybe you show us the the slide as well the slide is my favorite I mean, it kind of yeah, works. Kind but of, <laughs> like there's some sliding. Yeah. No, but it's kind of absurd, right? That it is a game, but it doesn't really allow you to play. I mean, um, yeah. You can and you can around. trick it maybe like through animation loops or like glitches that you that like, which is some sort of play, obviously as well. Um, but yeah. And um, and like, but it's just interesting talking about destruction in video games. Like some somehow sometimes like you have destruction, but then things that should move and are really stable and like indestructive. And uh, you like, for example, flagpoles, which is like how in how to disappear is explored as well. Flags and flagpoles, everything you can destroy, but the flag with the nation on uh, flag on it. Yeah, and as, as the swings don't swing, um, we then decided to build like an installation that would allow it somehow that the, the real world would kind of um, take care of it. It's kind of animated. So that was the idea of this installation. And um, another thing that we really did was uh, to, to, to do a lot of interventions and tours uh, in video games as we... Um, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun to play video games and to use them as a matter of, um, yeah, uh, talking about topics yeah. that we find important. Um, yeah, or interesting or are connected somehow to places. For example, in Deconstructing the Bridge, which was a small work that we did in Nijmegen in Holland um, um, for uh, Go Shorts um, and the Besindesus, which is like this really old uh, house in, in the, at the River Waal. And it, Obviously, like this um, was filmed in uh, Battlefield 5 again, like how to disappear. Um, but here we um, explore like the battlefield of Operation Market Garden, which was like in Holland, obviously. And uh, Nijmegen took a significant role in that. That it, um, this bridge that you see back, back there was destroyed and repaired by multiple parties and multiple people um, and takes uh, is ended up in... Um, Battlefield 5 as a map that's called Bridge to Nijmegen or or something, I think, or Arnhem, I don't remember. But it was some uh, mm. uh, that um, we, the, the our host in the Besinde Suisse knew a lot about the, he was a guide, some part-time guide, and he we, we um, basically showed him the game and said, hey, do you see that bridge? Um, it's like basically the same bridge that you see out of the window here, let's do a tour. And we did a tour, but it ended up like basically just showing those discrepancies between like the map in the game and the real world, because the, the basically there's like there was a whole town around it, but in the game you don't see that at all. It's just invisible. It's not there, um, which like just shows how replaceable those places are for as a backdrop for for a video game. Maybe we can show a short clip from that too. Very important bridge in the is a bridge part of uh, the national road plan. The national road plan was uh, uh, 
uh, created in 1927 and in 1927, the German plan the German bridges, the bridges were bridges were just before the bridges, and the bridges found the German discounters have been reinforced, have been reinforced, that's a rest as a division. It was clear. It was clear. The bridges could not be stopped. The plan was made to attack the bridges on both sides at the same time. So you see, by the way, by the way, this might be a general thing to say all around there. It's dangerous what you're doing. There's a piece of 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 the place. So, um, so, um, Maybe I can show a quick um, part back here. And, uh, and it's the largest city. It's, it's the largest city. So, I will carry on the surroundings and provides the rich non-makers for it. So, let's so, take a rest. Let's take a rest and enjoy the beautiful bridge, which is a bridge. So you get the point. Another tool format um, um, was developed in uh, 2021 for in, yeah, it, it, it was um, <laughs> quite a lot of things happened after uh, we did this project, but we were invited by the, by the crew of the uh, Russian pavilion of the uh, Venice Biennale um, that we would do a, a tour with them and with the crew of uh, of, of, uh, of the pavilion um, basically uh, talking about the, the history of soviet russia and the remnants and um, and it developed into kind of a, a bicycle tour uh, through the zombie apocalypse and in daisy on the daisy map um, we'd have to mention that um, of course, it, it, it was the, the escalation of the war happened in between, and um, and and Russia invading oh, right Ukraine, after, and yeah. every, pretty much right, right after. after. So, um, all the people that were with us there in the Russian pavilions, they had <laughs> to leave the country now, and um, and uh, we would do this project to different probably today, but still we find it uh, an important thing. Yeah. So. Um... Basically, like you mentioned, that it's a bicycle tour. Like our main goal was like, um, show, like, kind of like an informational tour through like this post-Soviet, post-apocalyptic landscape um, that is like basically infested by this like zombie uh, uh, beings. I don't know if, if any of you played they see, but it's like basically the zombies are just this backdrop, and the players are the real enemies, obviously, that you find and encounter. Um, but here we have this some sort of like a big group of people, peaceful, going together, bicycling, and um, then at one point leaving the bicycle, going on in a car, and using different means of transportation. Here we see um, see us on, on like train tracks, and we basically um, maybe that's we forgot to mention that we like the whole thing. The point is that all of us are really like young after the collapse of the Soviet Union, so we have this really distorted western view on this country um and on the like especially soviet times and um we just basically explore um and show those like russian curators how we see post-soviet russia um and um and or like this and and just explore like this all those topics together like urbanism um those like monuments uh the zombies that you can see here, um, the um, like nature you can uh, ha you have like underground bunkers, um, all like all those like allegories and like things, and the map itself that's like a smaller version of the Russian North, some somehow like uh, places that are thousands of kilometers apart you can just walk to uh, because it's so small, um, yeah. 
do you have any do you want to say uh, no no the, the basically question was uh, how how um these uh these um yeah these 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 artifacts how they kind of ended up in being the perfect backdrop for a zombie apocalypse um with, with coming from a very different uh, background and and from different time and how how, how that actually makes sense to, to, to go there so that was kind of the topic we were discussing yeah and and ob obviously like they see as a game is really interesting too or like this that was a modification of armor 3 which is like from bohemia interactive um and or like armor 2 i guess um uh and um that like kicked off this whole like revival of zombie survival games and like uh, basically like redefined battle royale and all this and like it's really influential title as well which is basically maybe our own our only not per se triple a game in our, maybe. In our list. yeah well, let's continue. Yeah. So enough of the tours. Um, there, there's uh, the project that um, I uh, will show you now is called Hardly Working, and uh, it has quite a different focus. Also, as uh, the uh, the focus of the collective has a little bit shifted from um, this uh, very pacifist agenda or pacifist um, uh, playing games pacif uh, in a in a peaceful way within video games from to of more uh, of a, a different kind of focus maybe as uh, um, taking taking capitalism as the main um, um, yeah well, a thing that we discuss in our works also and um, somehow if you think a lot about video games you kind of somehow end up with thinking about capitalism I guess so that somehow the focus shifted a little bit and in this case uh, we it's uh, also it's like a it's like a four channel video installations with uh, where you see four different characters and those are um, extras or, or NPCs within uh, the video game Red Dead Redemption 2 and um, what we did for this piece was like um, like really a kind of a work ethnography of NPCs like we followed them for an extremely long time and um, observed their lives protocol and what they're doing during the day and um, writing like writing down and, and measuring their time and what they do and how they function or not function and especially we were interested in the question of of their work and maybe on this point we can show the also one minute clip mm -hmm. Um, a still and uh, one minute the trailer I think is yeah very seriously she guides her room with intent the the gaze is directed at the ground, at, the ground, at, the ground at all times there's one particular spot she always pays special attention to. Maybe we're two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. She does nothing. There's one small area. There's one small area. Two hours. 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 We found this metaphor of uh, of those Sisyphus machines of uh, of NPCs actually really inspiring to think about what what work actually means and and how the how we can relate to this metaphor because of course on the one hand we have the feeling oh they're so stupid they're doing the same thing at the same, all at the same time and they're not can't, they're not able to change anything and um, but at the same time somehow everybody maybe knows the same kind of feeling that is quite different and you cannot really change anything by working and and kind of how is how is that kind of related to to, to capitalists, we know it, and we thought a lot about this. So, it kind of formulating a critique of work in capitalist times on the basis of uh, NPCs uh, in in this game was kind of great fun to do. Um, um, yeah, and also, of course, it's interesting because the NPCs somehow uh, represent normality always. Kind of the uh, the people that you kind of you, that differ from you as a player, and that kind of everything that they do is kind of creating um, authenticity and normality. Um, um, so kind of putting things into the focus that are usually in the background that is kind of something that we love to do and observing um, closely and obviously like really appreciate this work that the developers put into those like 
bringing them to life because many of them have really like long schedules throughout the day. So we follow like those like four different NPCs throughout the day from like, and it's it becomes really like they become really human and like sad. For example, he that uh, he he's like he doesn't really have a break like his only break or he he just smokes like a cigarette and then he continues with working for the player basically to let the world uh, feel alive uh, and ju just show that like um, it's really like yeah the dynamic basically and the most interesting thing is of course if you I mean if you I don't know ever observe NPCs for a longer time you of course immediately start kind of identifying and you make them human and you see yourself in them and you wonder is there maybe is there someone in there um, and uh, it happens and, and then what of course is interesting and that that they are not perfect working machines they're also of course they have bugs and like him um, and they kind of get stuck somewhere and they also somehow in some moments really refuse to do what they actually should do and and those moments were always the most magical ones in the observations when they apparently like uh, there's this one scene where um the broom of of the um, uh, street sweeper would disappear so the thing that she would usually do for the holy day uh she cannot do it because it just despawned because of a bug and so she's just standing there for the rest of her life and she cannot work anymore but also she doesn't have to work and what does this actually mean and like yeah okay so that's what this film is about um yeah and like Red Dead Redemption 2 we did actually a lot of works because it's such a nice game for like it has so many possibilities and without with the help of like uh, talented modders that we um that we contacted we um like worked in different uh, with different uh, topics and this is uh, is a tour again with uh, that's called red redemption which basically explores like uh, this capital of red dead redemption 2 is like called saint denis um, and explores like gives this like brute marxist like tour or like um through like how how this town works and like takes examples of the um of like workers and and like the class um in like um where do the rich people go in the night like they disappear from the streets the workers stay and uh and like in the slums there the, the 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 life exists outside of the houses which are basically just a like a, a potemkin town like there's you can't enter them um and um like yeah you want to say no it, it, we just we just thought it's good to um to to do like a crash course in marxism um in in this in this game and let's see if we can use it for for that to educate people that was kind of the idea and it's also of course fun because um i think video games are actually a great tool to for, to use to for for the educational purposes because um it's always fun to do it somehow and there always things happen spontaneously and uh, unexpectedly yeah so you can't control yeah, it, it's it's just a good it's just a good backdrop for for doing something really different with it yeah maybe one more thing that we that we um developed this a uh, tour again a tour yeah okay there are many tours um it's called everyday daylight and as you can see this is filmed in uh, gta 5 and um we have spent a lot of time um researching also other artistic projects that are taking place and other machinimas uh, leonhard the other crew member he just finished his phd where he collected a lot of different strategies of artists intervention uh, in video games and uh, interestingly um really a huge part of that happens in gta 5 and the, so the the question here is why actually in this game and why is it so so heavily used why is it like so funny right that most films in real world are shot in uh, in la or most western films at least and uh, it, it, the same goes for digital uh, version of uh, la which is los santos so the the town uh, the the city where gta um, takes place so we drive yeah. around the city and we basically do something like you know there in in hollywood there are those tour the, those buses where you go around and you s visit all those locations where you know um richard gear kissed uh, the, and then this he, uh, happens here so we're basically doing the same so driving around the city and um yeah. talking about what what films was shot where and what what um what 
important parts of game art was developed in <laughs> GTA on what place. Should we um, show a clip from that or should, how much time do we have? Is it like, okay. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, why well, not? I mean, I think basically, let's skip it because okay. it's basically, I say in the clip the same thing that I said yeah. here now. So I think this is a bit redundant. Um, but we would uh, show you also the kind of most contemporary uh, project that we have developed. It's called Kinderfilm. And yeah, maybe let's show the clip before, before I explain what it's about. Maybe a bit more important, uh, interesting. That's just a short teaser. The, the film is about um, the interesting phenomenon that in a lot of um, open world um, environments, there are actually no kids, of course, for the reason that um, they, it, it, they, there's this moral dilemma that, of course, if, if there would be kids, then like, this is one of those last really um, um, yeah, things that that, yeah. that 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 even the video game developers are really morally afraid of that people would do bad things with kids if they would be there. So basically, they created a world that is so terrible that it is just too dangerous for kids to exi to to exist there. So we found it kind of interesting and funny because there's a lot of references in the game, actually, a lot of playgrounds, a lot yeah. of schools, and all kinds of sites and the toy shop and everything. But there are no kids, and if you start looking at this phenomenon, it's really so weird. Um, but instead, there's a, there are a lot of cars around everywhere. Every, everything is driving like in big cars around. So um, this is what um, we thought it's interesting to make a film about it, about uh, the, the not existing kids and the abundance of cars, um, Yeah, which is maybe a funny metaphor. So this is something we're just working on at the moment, um, among other things. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, basically it. So like, follow us on instagram <laughs> just putting in this plug now and yeah. like if if you want to watch more or something like most of our stuff is on on our website so you can just like check it out or ask us and if you want a link or for a video that you like or yeah and um maybe if you have questions or something or want to add something or like yeah please do um, otherwise thank you <laughs> Uh, okay, let's wait still a bit with the discussion. Yeah, okay, okay you, um, you... Um, sorry, and we will present also our part. Just uh, give us a second to uh, get our presentation, but th thank you. And I have already some questions. Meanwhile, uh, this year we uh, kind of uh, get to this structure of having keynote speakers uh, as the superheroes and then uh, the local, local sidekicks. Uh, so it's NPCs. So it was actually Robin uh, as a Batman today, but we we we're we're gonna be the Robins of. Uh, of For anyone who played Skyrim, I would yeah. <laughs> Jo, tam je i ještě. Či jo? Slide. Aha, OK. A to dobývat. OK. Sorry. Uh, one of the most classic tropes uh, from contemporary left thinking, uh, from, uh, I don't know, Berardi and Zizek to Srnicek or Fisher, is that the crisis and normality somehow switched places. 
uh, like we are living in a constant state of exemption, constant crisis, uh, problems, mental health issues, anxiety, environmental crisis, resurgence of xenophobia, or a constant flow of streamlined mainstream bullshit culture takes command. Current game cultures are aligned with this uh, symptomatology. Survival elements are everywhere, be it uh, the countless survival colony factory farming city simulations, zombie apocalypse, or the crisis resource management, or the combative system of uh, most of the games itself. The urge to fight, compete, get better, uh, invest and play more uh, creates aggressive, affective tension. Uh, we have organized this uh, conference under a simple title on crisis, asking ourselves in what relation uh, are games with the critical times we live in. Our interest is not so much in the question of how games or online communication coexist or even thrive on the current crisis. Uh, rather, we wonder what gaming can do in such a situation. Uh, can we learn something through sharing the game experience together? Can we game the crisis uh, in the way in which the previous generation wanted to game the system, the system of nothing else than the, at the time newly established uh, neoliberalism? Games and life are both an art of being somewhere, mastering the rules of the local, leveling, scaling up, having a vision of a meaningful work and engagement with others. The question is how game experience can not only outsource uh, the ability from IRL, uh, IRL uh, day life, but how it can foster and stimulate our orientation in the so-called real world. In other words, the question may not be whether life has a bonus level, that's the name of our uh, paper here, uh, and, and not whether life has a bonus level, but be it an afterlife, uh, full self-realization and ultimate success in art, uh, finding the meaning of life or just gaming after work, but rather whether the games we play, both IRL or on PC or any other console, have meaningful ground in the real world. Ending on Fisherian note again, games not, uh, may, may not present only the dream space of our lives, but our reality may be the nightmare of our games. One of, one of the basic parameters of the interaction with the world that we experience in a simulated environment is our pleasure of free choice. The pleasure of being able to act, which at the level of interaction with the interface or di of digital devices implies the very action of uh, pressing a key, touching the display, and the reaction uh, of the interface to this action. Through human-computer interaction, we enter a feedback loop, becoming our digital avatars, inhabiting worlds and its carefully constructed someone else's stories. In order to have the most powerful immersive experience possible, the experience of being immersed in a pretended reality, we are willing to turn a blind eye to the imperfections of the construction of such worlds. In a seemingly open space full of possibilities, we come across invisible walls, corridors directing our movement in a pre prepared dramaturgy script. Although we enjoy the fact that it is our decisions that direct the development of the story, our decisions are more a form of the result to be achieved. Uh, let's explore the premise of game decision making further in a quick look at Elden Ring, the latest installment in From Software's popular Soul series. And the which character on the conference posters and also on the screen is one of the most enigmatic Elden Ring characters. Her quest line offers Age of Stars ending, one of the possible game conclusions and probably the most cryptic one. Rene envisions a world without the Golden Order, the hegemonic force in the game world. The Golden Order is allowing the everlasting stasis of the living dead game characters and landscapes. In a sense, Rene's narrative Ayn is the only positive ending in the game, since she is radically subverting the hegemony and mystical narrative of the game's oppressive world. <laughs> Therefore, Elden Ring's stasis and hege hegemony of the Golden, or or Golden Order could be seen as an allegory of contemporary capitalism. In contrast, 
from the perspective of game labor and exchange, the other ring represents a classic game rhetoric of play more to get better. This rhetoric is implying that players need specific talents and skills <clears throat> to succeed in the game and its online competitive modes. This approach does presupposes a rhetorical promise of meritocratic fairness along with exclusion of flex, the less successful competitors and so-called weaker players. It is relying on specific modes of exchange, often conceived as classical or traditional. I believe that the material of this rhetoric directly constructs its extra diagetic economies of attention and market-related ideologies. However, in my reading, the Elden Ring's game narrative is in contradiction with the idea of accumulation of capital. The cycles of accumulating capital, which are inevitably leading to numerous crises, that in real life can be seen most strikingly in the failure of the free market ideologies to tackle the current climate crisis. And here we are getting back to Rene the Witch, because from her narrative perspective, <laughs> we need to break from the accumulation of the game cycles to truly win the game. A League of Legends, uh, which we will play tomorrow together, uh, represents not only an ultra-successful business all to, uh, with all traditional features of monetization from loot boxes and seasonal passes to skin economies and celebrity collapse. It is also quite an almost unprecedented hero design and multiverse lore. Of course, uh, Runeterra, where uh, LOL is actually situated, is classic uh, fantasy, magic enthralled world uh, where each one of those heroes has like a formative trauma that uh, in this um, um, flat fashion defines the struggle and identity of each hero. Uh, for instance, uh, Silas being an imprisoned magician in an anti-magician, almost racist, Demacia, Viego, the ruined king, defined by his obsessive toxic love for which he immiserated his whole kingdom. Uh, Seraphim being the happy haunted music superstar, talenting in listening to one's private songs to such an extent that she hears only the cacophony of others' voices and not her own. Um, being like this kind of uh, Kardashian uh, embodiment. In most cases, the personal myth also translates in, into the game mechanics of each hero. Like in the case of Seth, who is a sleek, cool mobster from Ionia, known for, um, mainly known for withstanding any pain and any penalty. And in the game, he gains crit, so-called crit, from receiving damage that actually makes him stronger. And there's uh, far more. Each hero actually features uh, many skins that you can obtain for the premium credit. And uh, each skin somehow theoretically induces a new universe in which this, um, this hero, uh, he or she, um, uh, features also. But um, maybe this is uh, the, the brief uh, and kind of obvious lesson from League of Legends. Uh, the uh, one-dimensional heroes flexibly accumulated, as Jameson, uh, Frederick Jameson would put it, into an imaginary multiverse of stories and action, uh, which is what makes uh, LOL so successful and effective. Uh, but maybe we should learn this lesson not only in the way of how to disentangle, disengage uh, the identity making, what Simon Don calls individuation, from, let's say, the commodification, monetization, but maybe uh, the question and the lesson is how to actually use, uh, how to navigate, how to inhabit the world where our identities are already commodified and monetized. Yesterday, I went home after work with a single goal in mind to finish a timed challenge quest during the last day of Apex Legends seasonal event to get the last 400 points of, of, to obtain the very last limited weapon skin for an assault rifle. I don't necessarily like or use that much. They've nerfed it. I made it eight minutes until the end. Immediately after the spellbound challenge ended, new one sprang up with another 5,000 points to farm. Such is the nature of games as a service. Feedback loop approach to game design and defined by engagement rates. Maslach speaks of nightmares, but those nightmares might as well be nightmarish habits. A few speculative points. 
First, the loot, box, the loot boxization of media experience. Ever since the first Beethoven randomized loot boxes appeared in the game in Maple Story, their steady march have deeply penetrated the game culture. Much has been written about the obvious parallels between randomized, often cosmetic boxes and gambling. Shout out to Game Study Buddies podcast. The uncountable odds in intricate drop systems of so called gacha games and predatory business tactics of new with Diablo Immortal. The randomized loop is ever present. Direct RSS feeds were replaced by algorithmically curated selection of content, and every time you pull down to refresh in Instagram, you get a new set of maybe finally the coolest posts. TikTok, for you, now copied by Twitter, represents the pinnacle of decoupling our content consumption from outdated logics of consumer-producer relations, meaning following followers. Instead, presenting never-ending stream of pre-selected videos where each swipe down represents a new chance at something really great. A little amulet akin to Tinder swiping, preying on our infinity to what if instinct. Maybe a lot of our media experience, even the game ones, behave this way. Take solo queuing for a multiplayer game like League of Legends or Dota 2 or Battle Royale. The odds of getting a great experience are so small, most likely you'll end up frustrated or even better. Worth it. A game of jargon for a state of frustration that one seeks to remedy by just one another game and that one that will finally be the one to break the losing streak, or getting a team full of Russian kids with no team play. One good like game per 10 trashy ones. Roll the dice with your time. Might as well find some skins on the side. Second, we seem to crave the other's presence. Even when we don't need it, or more precisely, and without more judgment, haven't needed it. This important is the new objects of game liberality, Genshin Impact, Open world RPG that is free but riddled with gacha monetization mechanics. But it is also a laboratory of all the angry engagement first practices that we see more and more even in premium titles. Numerous currencies, daily quests, daily expeditions, daily reputation quests, adventure rank, experience rank, exploration rewards, seasonal quests, story quests, daily dungeons, dungeon cooldown resetting items, and much more I probably missed. Skyrim had one quest log and that was it. Record Wise 2. The US iteration of open world RPG does not need for the core experience of any of these polished Excel sheets full of incentives presented to players. Uh, but nevertheless, it is absolutely full of them. A paradigm shift. Do we need the oversight or is it beneficial for the sales department if my whole year studio behind Genshin Impact? Both. How to untangle this all day and not? Before we bought the CD and played the game on our own terms, if you want to get re if you want to really get the most out of Genshin Impact, most in terms of uh, game in game accumulation as per Philip's perspective, you have to actively keep track of so many systems, make the game the integral part of your everyday life, everyday routine, subjecting yourself to the ever present knowledge of some virtual task, point collection bar, quest line, item cooldown, seasonal event. Did we get so used to the neoliberal oversight that we can't even play anymore without a machine holding its gaze over our waking hours? Third, in a way, it is a perfect neoliberalization, neoliberalization of gameplay. Everything we Philip talks about was praised for the simplicity of its accumulation model, where the currency you get and the things you unlock adhere to the old model of RPG, more general game mechanics kill enemies to gather currency and items to buy better items. Finish a quest to unlock some new content like areas, endings, story times. Easy. In Genshin Impact, the open world is overlaid by at least two additional matrices, one of extra budgeted tasks related mostly to monetization. Gacha, after all, plays upon collector's fetish impulse, here represented by cute anime characters, and another of multiple interlocking systems that you can maximize. 
Using the currency rules in Elden Ring to track your progress, economic standing, the career. Now, mostly universal property that most of the game content all centers to. The multiplicity of, of Genshin Impact systems is the point. The multiple demands that different systems make, utilizing every aspect of gameplay and the game world. No more gathering to cook in game meals or craft recipes. Every such activity has an accompanying quest or achievement or explore feat tied to them. After all, we would do something just for the sake of it. Noble drive to monetize and make every part of our life useful and economically profitable runs through the veins of current game mechanics paradigm and other digital worlds where we perform for the algorithms, taking photos of our foods, conferences, artworks, pets, family members, offices, and anything and everything, in an effort to rate the number of accumulated likes, the standing on the attention market. Every part of our life and minute of our day it's a potential content to be posted and aligned with an, our outward facing persona that can lend us a new better that can lend us a better job, new exhibition, new viral TikTok that will make us into influencer superstar so we can alleviate some of the precariousness of our existence under capitalism. Perhaps finally start saving up for a mortgage. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> this is almost it. Well, maybe, maybe we can invite back uh, Brutal Refusal. And uh, there's um, time for almost final discussion, at least for today. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, so some questions we're just reorganizing, but but uh, some questions either from the audience or from you. To wrap up this block before the final roundtable, uh, we will just like gather here. And so, if you have any remarks, questions, mostly towards total refusal, though there are few way numbers, please do raise them. Or if you just want to, I don't know, ask us something, do. But we're mostly here for them, though. So. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you could, but we have three, so thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in these uh, meta gaming practices. I think it was uh, they're really really cool to watch, and I will definitely check them out on your website. Uh, I'm uh, this is sort of like I'm curious. Uh, do you know of any sort of environmentalist or eco meta gaming practices, whether um, so those that you know yourself, or because you just said that your your colleague or your team member is. Uh, wrote like a, uh, a, a, did his PhD on it. So I'm kind of interested also like to see if, if and when that will go public uh, and if they maybe have some. I mean, he's not here, um, but um, I, what comes into my mind is uh, a friend of ours. Uh, he's called Felix Klee, a German um, uh, Klee, K-L-E-E. -E. Um, I know that he did a lot um, of some films uh, about um, about nature, I'm sure, uh, at least. I, I don't know. Yeah, there's one film that he did about whales and the history of whaling, where, where whales are kind of raining from the sky in GTA. Yeah, and I think it's like in Anno as well, like uh -huh. the using Anno finally for something like meaningful. <laughs> um, but otherwise, I think I would have to think a bit more. Yeah. Or do you know any any more? Uh, no, I mean, what I can add maybe is like, that is really interesting, like to, to go back to your um, uh, presentation, where you that you mentioned that there is like, um, uh, like um, this seasons, the seasons and the like topic of um, climate crisis or crises that are connected to seasons and and weather that this is actually a topic that maybe comes up now and like there might be like at least in video games like more like triple a like mainstream video games probably more like 
um, uh, going towards that. But in the indie, like the indie world, is obviously way faster and like way more interesting in their what they choose for a video game. Um, but I don't like, yeah, I don't know any like intervention techniques that are going into that direction. But it's really interesting uh, to do something with that. Definitely. <laughs> We will let you know. Yeah, there's something that came up uh, now is that I, I know that um, there is a mod for um, also for GTA Five, where they have um, where they have modified uh, the sea level, so the basically the whole city is underwater and um, that it kind of deals with the topic. And of course, the whole game becomes totally absurd because nothing is working anymore because everything is underwater, and um, that's something that has something to do with it. Yeah, maybe I can add something there because that's definitely a, a thing with mods that they ch like they remove or add water and see what happens with the game. So that's like a uh, like I know like for example in Fallout like there's definitely like there were mods to attempts to remove all the water and make this some sort of drought to just see what's underneath. Usually it's to to reveal something, but it's still like some sort of intervention in like changing the whole game in a way removing all the water is really drastic yeah. we're also on the art school so let it be a thrown glove for anybody who wants to do a uh, climate game intervention uh, do we have any other questions comments remarks or should i first of all love to ask something that, uh, that 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 came up in your uh, talk also i think in the part that you uh, said was the this um is something that uh, we um we talk a lot about is this that there's so interesting right that um games are often so very good in giving you this feel feeling that you are free and that it's like a limitless, limitless world, um, and also in like service player report that this is one of the most, the strongest feelings that they have when they play games that they feel free. Um, but of course, in fact, this is <laughs> this is never t the case, of course, um, to 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 various degrees. But it's just so, it's it is so interesting, right? That you forget that you are in a very channeled. Um, um, space and that but the, and the borders are there they're invisible and if you go looking for them of course you see them but um but you can really forget that they are there and this is so seductive of this medium that um that also you forget that there is something like an algorithm that is kind of that is kind of behind everything an algorithm that is of course usually at least for most games it, it is 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 associated with um with yeah, with capitalist interests, of course. So an algorithm that is just there uh, for, 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 for some reason, but to generate, to hold you in the game. And um, so, yeah, that's just something that I could connect to what you said. Well, I, I, well at least for my part of the talk, I would also argue, okay, maybe I'll return. <laughs> Makes more uh, structural sense. Uh, is that it's not only about the algorithm, but like I have an example, there's this really great video on Genshin Impact that's called the Serious Critique of Genshin Impact. And it's kind of an introspective journey of the YouTuber. He's not an academic, but kind of an honest YouTuber uh, wrestling with his like thoughts about the game and so forth. And he... At first, he's like, yes, this game, even though we all know it's like a getcha, predatory, whatever system, it does create a genuine like sense of wonder of exploring the world and genuine connection with some characters. And he specifically mentions like meeting this one character, I don't remember the name, but one of the, the characters, and he really connects with the character. And he says, yes, this the game really can does it. And then, but then follows that very soon afterwards you meet this character like organically in the game through a quest you get uh, like a seasonal event with her where you can obtain her through loot boxes basically <laughs> and he's like and now this is where it breaks for me because now i know that the connection is there just for me to get emotionally attached to her and to want to obtain her and calculate the odds in one of those god awful like sheets uh, so maybe this, this this freedom to feel or whatever is not on the le uh, is not curved only on level of algorithm, but also on the like more meta level of the end goals of the game experience. If that makes sense. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting that, like, I guess all this is all made on purpose and, like, sometimes we don't even realize how deep it goes. Like, you know, this character is on purpose really interesting and relatable. So you, like you said, by, like, the pack, the access to it. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? Great, I'm coming over. Thank you. I just have a small question to tell Rick, uh, refusal. I think it's just interesting. I wanted to ask about your gaming research practices. Like, I guess in the beginning you end up doing your artworks out of the games you were playing anyways, but do you now allocate certain time of the day to just grind through the games to find something interesting? Or is it mostly something you like yourself or some of it is actually work? Like, would you play something you really don't like just for the project? <laughs> I mean, um, I, I, I had to um, force myself to play Battlefield 5 because I'm such a bad multiplayer ga gamer. I'm really uh, a victim. Um, and um, yeah, so we, to, to some degree, yes. But um, I mean, <laughs> of course, it's, it's kind of, it's not like now is the uh, free time of <laughs> border. Now we, <laughs> we kind of play what we actually like. Um, but it's true what you say that um, most projects, uh, they arise from just playing games and um, having uh, eyes open and um, that requires um, not being stressed or not having too many obligations but just to go into it and have, have enough time of course since <laughs> it's this crazy time consumption um, consuming um, um, thing to do but um, so this is something that we we have sometimes we have to force ourselves a little to um, to make to to yeah to make yeah, to, to, to plan our schedule so we have enough time to really uh, do that. But it's not that we would force ourselves, but we have to um, discipline ourselves to play a bit more. Yeah, but I think like sometimes it feels like work for me at least, like <laughs> playing those, especially trip, like the triple A, like the big titles, um, where like usually um, playing and discussing and doing everything at the same time is sometimes really challenging like where do you draw the line like you, robin said um, um but then uh, other times it's just that's where the best stuff comes out from when you actually just play and like have fun and then you realize things about the game that you couldn't have had like like have the same approach from like an academic or like an outside level so you have to go in there's no other way you have to play it um, even if, yeah, if it would be work or, yeah. Plus, I have to say that for 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 the productivity of, uh, of the collective, um, actually, really, um, the pandemic actually really helped. And um, we just realized how many projects we realized in 2021, like a whole bunch, and uh, like it, we were so crazy productive because we had nowhere to go, and um, so that that also helped. Thank you. So do we have any other questions? You can also ask about Elden Ring. Philip's still with us, if you want. <laughs> or do we have some intro yeah. panel? How many times did you finish it or did you finish it at all? <laughs> but I spent two, 200 hours to do it. So <laughs> but yeah. I guess we can have a short break before the big discussion. Last call for the question before the big discussion. Or even last call into the panel? No? Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, since it's the last question and, uh, you know, I shouldn't open a new can of worms, uh, I'd actually be interested if, you know, from each of you, if there is a game you're looking forward to and what it is. To which we are looking forward to? Uh, yeah, a game mm -hmm. you're looking forward to, like, you know, to open up or to, like, explore, to mess around with. I mean, of course, uh, 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 GTA 6, of course, because it's just, you know, there are not so many games that are open world and that play in current times where you can, where you have our time, like, represented. This is always somehow more interesting. And then, of course, GTA always allows for more 
awesome modding opportunities and to like the rockstar games are just great very good to exploit so this is of course something we um, are looking forward yeah i would say the same like from a work perspective <laughs> Because like if it ticks those boxes, then it's definitely something I would I look forward to because of the possibilities. Um, one game that I'm that is kind of like a guilty pleasure of mine that I will probably never experience is Star Citizen. Ah. Like I would definitely say that if any of you know that, um, <laughs> which is like controversial, but it's still like the dream game per se for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess we're looking forward for this uh, left mainstream AAA game that Alfie Baum was maybe alluding to. That that proves him wrong, that the revolution will not come through a video game and that actually... <laughs> what about... I, mean, I have the very last question. That's because I sometimes feel like, uh, yes, we are very much critically interested in both indie underground games or like these AAA gamer gamer titles. Like we also have games like Fortnite, but also like Roblox, which are massively huge and maybe even like larger than Fallout or whatever. I don't know the numbers probably are, uh, but they are super influential and important. And also Roblox is pretty open in some ways, but also politically totally contentious. So maybe isn't that something that's interesting to you to kind of look beyond the traditional AAA gaming space to more of, I don't know, what Roblox is. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, we uh, haven't used uh, neither Minecraft or Roblox for uh, any of the project because we always found it kind of more um, more fun to make uh, to to use a really to to use a more kind of narrow games. Especially, we enjoyed really uh, using um, Ubisoft games because they are just so close and stupid, um, usually, and that it's just more fun to work with them and to make fun of them also somehow. And there's also more to criticize often, so this is easier. But yeah, maybe we should open up. I wasn't a criticism though, <laughs> but yeah, I, definitely interesting Roblox and stuff. Like, there's many topics to be explored there, and I mean. Usually, I think maybe it's it's about um, uh, eye candy as well. There, like you know, like the games that look the best and have the best graphic. That's like obviously interesting too. Like this hyper real nature of um, of those video games that have like the best engine always and stuff. <laughs> There's like yeah, and then it has so many limitations and has like the same like gameplay basically in a way, like. Alfie and you talked about too um, a little bit. Thank you. I see. So unless we, okay, unless there's one last tweet in this direction, okay, there's not. Uh, maybe it's, it's it's a swear word now to say tweet. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so we will have a little break. No. Let's continue. So Václav will continue. <laughs> with the, so I should invite all the speakers. So all the previous speakers that are still, re still with us, please come over, which will be beaten over. <laughs> and we can start with the round table, which I don't know if I'm moderating. So go there if I'm the moderator. <laughs> okay. I mean, you should. Uh, we are a highly organized group, and uh, so let's open up. I, I don't know if uh, you panelists want to begin with uh, some remark, a uh, question, a uh, feedback. Yep. Andre. I actually, I, I have a direct question to Laura I wanted to ask during the break. 
But do you know Factorio, a Czech game that actually has a kind of interesting, uh, I guess, environmental, procedural, mechanical uh, stuff in it? Hmm. Uh, I didn't know it was Czech. That's a pleasant surprise. I, uh, I, I know Factorio. I've never played it, but it's actually part of the Library of Games for Change under the sort of environmental tag. Uh, which is strange because it looks uh, like it doesn't, like it wouldn't belong there. But yeah, it has this really cool sort of, well, it's a, um, it's a sort of you crash land on, an, uh, on a planet and then you have to uh, sort of, um, you have to kind of build your way down a really, really elaborate tech tree up until sort of rocket fuel and, you know, um, space age uh, technology basically to uh, get off the planet. And meanwhile, obviously like uh, developing that kind of technology, that level of industrialization causes all kinds of pollution to uh, happen. And that angers the natives and the natives are this like race of uh, uh, creepy insects that uh, attack your base. So it's another one of these games that um, in my dissertation, I talk about uh, so-called Gaia games, which are kind of environmental God games where you find the same mechanic, right? So the challenge is to industrialize and to reach space age technology, but in a new generation of that kind of game, what the what's built in is the sort of planet fights back motive. And in um, Factorio, it's quite literal. The, these creatures are like, they'll, they'll attack your base. But in the Gaia games that I wrote about my thesis, it's more um, uh, global warming, sea level rise, Superstorms, that kind of stuff. But it's the yeah, it's such an interesting uh, graphical, like visual design as well. Specifically, like the 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 color choices for the different conveyor belts. So the first time I looked at this game, I really got the sense that like what you're looking at is a circuit board, right? It, it, at the very beginning, you see nothing, but then as you uh, build, 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 expand, 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 you're basically building something that looks so like computerized, so well, literally like a circuit board. And I think it's specifically also that like the green conveyor belt, like um, sort of combined with the red. Um, so I, I thought that that was really cool, the sort of like gradual um, exposure of the digitality, the materiality of the computer coming to the fore. But uh, yeah, I've not played it yet. I would love to have the chance or the time. I don't want to steer the discussion from the get-go, but I would argue that... I, actually, this is in the way of my question in the... Yeah, like it was technically afternoon, but like the early afternoon. Is that actually in the factory? I think this like... You could easily make a critical reading of the game like the player is actually the bad guy because the insects in there trying to attack you are attacking you just because you are destroying their habitat so you know saving yourself versus destroying the planet is kind of a moral tale where we are the bad guys but like that's not what the engagement of the game fun is about right the game fun is about making the factories and like earning the achievements and like getting the fun out of the automated factory that can ultimately play videos or whatever because it's super modular so i mean that's the that's the maybe kind of a critical critical dissonance in a lot of like entertainment first titles where we have the critical message but it necessarily gets muddled by the source of fun which there is the construction the destruction the I don't know, supremacy over nature where you built your first nuclear reactor. Yeah, this, I mean, this is something uh, that, that um, I think is, is really uh, such a fundamental part of most meta-narratives in games, right? This um, narrative that you kind of, you start in a hostile world and then you grow bigger until you dominate it, kind of, and you really... Um, there's there's no monster big enough for you to kill in the end for almost for all games not 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 like there's some exceptions like i don't know subnautica or something but most mostly that's kind of the trope right and also nature in the beginning and there are many enemies or there's a whole surrounding that is kind of difficult for you and too too strong and too big but if you if you fight if you if you if you put enough work in it then uh, you you're certain that you will uh, be able to to match everything somehow right isn't that like i mean yeah it's just it's just um 
it's uh, it's just easy to imagine that this has uh, that that there's kind of a <laughs> this mirroring how somehow we how we're treating the planet as well and and right this kind of an, an easy um comparison to make probably right yeah there's i mean it's definitely i think would i would say like a driving uh like a core trope of a lot of game genres um i read a really good article about it where it's called the sort of mechanic or the fantasy of tether and accretion, right? Mm -hmm. The sense that you tether yourself to a, a base, a home, and you uh, accrete, uh, acquire, I don't know, <laughs> gather more uh, stuff. And then that allows you to go further and further and further. And yeah, this is the sort of the, the skeleton of like a lot of different video games. But um, there are other types of games, I think, uh, but it, they are, it's kind of risky to, to make those because of, um, I guess, fun, right? Because we, 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 we think that this is fun and I, I get it also. I like, uh, yeah, I mean, cause it's just like really enjoyable to sort of like expand yourself like that in a virtual world, but there's, uh, so one of the games that was on one of my slides actually, cause it's, I talk about it in the same chapter as I talk uh, uh, in the same one where I talk about Frostpunk, it's called The Stillness of the Wind, mm -hmm. where you um, you play this uh, old lady character called Talma, and at the very beginning of the game, we, I mean, there's not much like to do. You just like manage this cute little farm. You have some goats, you have some chickens. Um, so it looks like a farm game. Uh, looks are deceiving. It is not a farm game. It's very depressing, actually. Uh, so over the course of kind of like a couple of days, very, very, very gradually, things start changing, right? The atmosphere becomes darker. Um, the, uh, the days become shorter. You receive really uh, disturbing news by mail that there is like a disease and like cities nearby are collapsing and people are going missing. It's super fucking... Uh, like really, really, really kind of uh, anxiety-inducing, and then, and then, you know, you also, you, Tom, I like you. You sort of lose things to do. I mean, I'm, I hate to spoil the game, but I'm going to spoil the game. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, over the course of the game, your goats die, and then your chickens die, and then your garden like withers, and you just have nothing left to do. So you just wander. You're like, oh my God, and then. Um, because you play this old lady, she grows older and older, so her pace is slower and slower. So towards the end of the game, you're just mo you're moving so slowly through this dying world, um, and um, yeah, and like and it's it's a boring time as well, right? You have this stick that's um, kind of leaning to your house, which initially you don't you kind of go like, oh, what do I need this stick for, right? Because I have to milk my goats, I have to make cheese, I have to do whatever. But towards the end, when you don't have the goats and you don't have the cheese and you don't have the, the chickens, you pick up the stick and you're just like drawing lines in the sand. And like, that's all that's left for you to do at the end of the world, you know, when like everything's been robbed from you. So this is a completely opposite arc, right? To that, like, um, tether yourself somewhere and expand. Uh, it's a it's a very experimental game, I think. But oh God, by God, like we do, we need more of these kinds of experiments. Yeah, I remember actually reading a Steam review about it that the person was really really angry about this because it he thought it would be like a farming, a really nice cozy farming simulator, and um, and people really defended it. It was really cool to see this like fan base of this game, and it showed me, oh yeah, there's actually many people that would love to play those. And even like people that get surprised by them, it's like, it's so powerful, you know, like infiltrate this genre and then turn it into something else is a big potential, I think, that needs to be there more, yeah. At any time, if you have any questions, please do like raise your hand and I'll get back to you. So I wonder what like other sort of if you were to think of other really stereotypical game genres, what like what would the biggest subversion there be, right? For example, so we've done the farming sim, but there's like horror survival, there's you know action adventure, there's like the dating sim or whatever, you know. Like I'm so it would be so cool to sort of think of. Uh, I mean, I don't really, I don't make digital games, I make LARPs because I can't code, but it'd be so cool to. Uh, it's such a cool sort of exercise to imagine them differently, right? To imagine them sort of subverted.
Uh, I guess there are not much games like that, like there are some, but <clears throat> somehow, at least from the discussion, it looks like that. I know like there are lots of games which are quite interesting. I would be interested, like, if you had a like, chance or a reason to redesign uh, Frostpunk, for example, what would be the change you would do, like either mechanically or like narrative-wise? In Frostpunk, uh... I mean, I think Frostbook already is a pretty, uh, is a pretty, it, it's already, is, I think, pretty innovative in the sense that it has this tech tree that you don't, sh that you shouldn't develop, right? I think that's quite subversive. Um, what I, uh, it also has, I didn't talk about the scenario, but it's in my, uh, it's in my chapter. There's a, a scenario in Frostpunk where instead of building kind of from the, building with a blank slate, you uh, fix somebody else's city. And that also is, is something I think is really intriguing because, um, I mean, that's kind of the challenge that we're in right now, right? Like, we live in a world that's already been built over and we have to uh, uh, sort of <laughs> we have to, uh, fix it and not, like, we don't have the luxury of starting anew. So, um, and I think that's, that scenario is called the fall of winter home. So it's all about kind of trying to fix this, uh, this city that was built wrong. And then ultimately you run out of time and you in fact have to evacuate the city, which is also quite hard because you have to, yeah, because it asks you to abandon, right, the city. And in a city builder, I think that's still also quite a powerful move. I think maybe the only, so what I, uh, what I think is, in, I guess that one more thing that you could subvert in Frostbunk is this idea that you have, um, uh, it's a still a city builder that really centralizes power, right? Ultimate, ultimately, you are the person who's who's calling the shots. I I would like to see a game. I think I'm interested in a game where um, you you are part of a community, but things are much more run like anarchistically or like by uh, consensus by. Or there's just kind of maybe more of a sense of democracy going on. I mean, you already get that more in multiplayer games, but since I don't play many multiplayer, I'm really craving that experience in a single player game. I have actually an uh, answer to both of the, your previous question and this one. Oh, I'm sorry, if you want to react, I'm not the most important here anyway. Yeah, but maybe I'll be interesting. Uh, I mean, the first one is a game that I will talk only briefly because you mentioned it in your dissertation, actually, which I know because I just looked it up. And it's a, it's a game that's called Ikenia, and it's I think he, it, it's a n nice city. city? It's a it's a Polish city. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, not, not nice. Uh, anyway, that's not it. Yeah, Lichenia, Lichenia. I I I I don't know. I don't I don't I don't really know. Uh, anyway, it's a game that I think it's even like touted as a like anti city builder, uh, anti uh, anthropocene city builder. Okay, this is not loading, so I will just like pull up uh, a picture. Uh, yeah, a game last <laughs> uh, Yeah, and it looks like this. Uh, and it's a game that actually, like, you all you all you can do is you have all these. Uh, it's it's in the start you have five, but you will eventually get seven of different blocks that you can. I think you, you use a really nice word there. It's plop in the, in the text. You plop them and into the and into the grid, and the grid reacts like the. It's not like you build a single whole house, but the whole like ecosystem or how to call it like reacts to it, uh, kind of uh, unexpectedly and also unpredictably. So it is to me kind of similar. It is kind of a subversion of the top-down master plan approach. That if I would pretend to be smart, uh, I would say uh, the traditional city builders like SimCity would be like the top-down master plan architecture or urban design, and this would be like speculative design that um, is more about uh, networks and relationships than about the single buildings or whatever. So this would be like one example of a supervision, a subversion, which I really like, by the way, also because all the works by Paolo Benercini, they also have a narrative. So it looks, it's not just that you have this game mechanical argument there, but you also have this narrative about floating mattresses and like post-apocalyptic world, which really do help to kind of paint the emotional picture there. Uh, and when it comes to the, the anarchistic government, 
governance or is it really anarchistic too? Uh, it's, um, I think it's called Earth Socialism. Oh, have you heard? Have heard. Have heard. Yeah, heard. Yeah. Sorry. And the book is coming. Yes, it's funny because the game is actually marketing for the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's a book that came out in Warsaw and they did a simulation, which uh, is, I mean, it has its problems. It's for one, it's super complicated and obtuse. But the, basically, it's like we have a socialist revolution on the globe, and you have like a united committee, and you are the governor uh, of the committee or like the head of the committee. And you have to, if I click just through this tutorial, you have to enact policies that take some years to to uh, to take into effect, and you have to balance your like political power and also the social unrest and so forth. And you can obviously transition from fossil fuels, uh, demand vegan uh, <laughs> vegan uh, vegan food, yeah, vegan diet, yes, or a lot of different other like ways the society can go. Uh, you have also libertarian you have utopia if you want. So maybe this is like a kind of an interesting example of, I don't know, a leftist game that is trying something that games maybe are good for, like simulating dynamic thing. So is it? I don't know. <laughs> um, so I'm teaching a, a course called Cyber Climates, Computing Environments, Playing Games with the Earth, this term. Uh, and I'm going to have my students play this, actually, just because I... Um, because uh, what we'll talk about is the history of, of climate simulation, um, like for science, right? Scientific climate simulation, which originates in a lot of uh, uh, sort of um, war, basically, right? Like uh, the 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 first people to think about that were immediately thinking, how can we militarize this? Um, but uh, sort of my part in that course is to talk about climate simulation in uh, arts and culture. So obviously I'm going to talk about games, among other things, right? Media art as well. But um, so half earth socialism is, uh, it's interesting that you say that it's, uh, that you find it so complicated. It is complicated, but I am familiar with fate of the world, which is like the more complicated version than this. And also a little bit more pessimistic. This of course is like, well, it's a, it's a socialist game. Uh, fate of the world is more, um, like the, the winning strategy in that game is to uh, use sulfate aerosols and to keep uh, temperatures down while you while, while global population drops. Basically, this is a uh, it, it looks a little less snazzy, I think, but it's a very, very tough simulator uh, to play. I've never beaten the strong like the the the, the most difficult level. Um, can't be done. <laughs> yeah, it was just um, some some something to add to those two games or like, yeah, but um, half of socialism, I, I mean, I heard and I haven't played it yet, but because I just recently discovered it for some reason, <laughs> a few days before mm. this, um, but um, like the, that it's like, really like a social, you know, socialist, like you can't, there's not much freedom that you can do. Like it just only goes into two or three different directions and, and something to add to this, like um, it's cool. Like, I think those games are really great to uh, teach um, as well, like to, to, to give awareness and to, to explore different things. And, um, but it's actually really interesting, for example, in, in you, you talked like a, about like a liberal, um, you know, utopia or neoliberal utopia as well. They could, you could create, like for example, in SimCity, there's people that attempted in this game, like the sandbox environment to attempt it to like, we cut all the taxes, you know, reduce, <laughs> like cut down the control of the player as much as possible and see what happens. Like, obviously it's kind of like a satire because it doesn't work. Like the symmetries pile up like the bodies and it gets hor horrifying. Like, they, and in the end, like the meteor comes and has to destroy <laughs> everything to make space because you can't destruct those things that the problems, like you, they don't go away, but the meteor can let them disappear, like, obviously. But um, so it's interesting to to yeah this kind of again this intervention of like try it in a game that's not meant for it as well like the potential there um, like it's some it's a uh, some sort of um, yeah city skylines not some city yeah yeah there's many like uh, city skylines like really cool like trials for different models of urbanism and like uh, 
radical things as well that people attempted there, uh, which is interesting, I think, and has a lot of potential as well to be, yeah. Thank you. Do we have anybody in the audience? I mean, it doesn't have to be tied to city builders. <laughs> yeah. I'll come for, I'll come, okay. If you can comment on a game, I, uh, I find uh, very touching me in the last years, but I always remember it, even in Arcadia. Uh, maybe you can find some picture because it's kind of a disruptive uh, gaming principle because you cannot play it uh, actually too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the author of this game says it's uh, inspired by situa situationism of Guy Debord. And it's about like opening new planets. They, they are building new planets because the Earth uh, is a garbage, uh, which went. They like abandoned the, like uh, a waste. And uh, they are building, and uh, like uh, actually, it uh, starts at the opening of this new planet built by some company, and you follow the characters which have some conversation. And uh, the playing is like uh, following these conversations, which which go in, into and this orchard uh, in one time uh, goes burning, and it's kind of psycho. Pathological, you, you have some experience <laughs> with this game? It looks really interesting. I have Actually, I didn't it. find to, to the principle how to uh, go further in, in the game, but I enjoy it very, very much because the conversations and, and you have to catch the people because they are going um, different directions, different couples or groups. And you don't know uh, who will talk about what, and by following them and kind of randomly uh, going into some conversation in some place, uh, you find some story, and the uh, and the story continues somehow. But, so maybe like we haven't played the game, so you can tell us why, uh, how, sub why is it subversive, or how is it subversive, how is it critical, how it works as a critical device medium. Oh. I don't know, it's critical in terms of, uh, it's a critique of, of this building of planets because some people are uh, from this co company showing it. Uh, this is our newest achievement and we control the level of oxygen and orchards and like this. And other people are against uh, like uh, putting the old earth into waste and uh, forming new planets and uh, they are like, uh, they have some trauma from, from that. Mm. And it's, uh, these uh, oppositions are playing in, in these uh, dialogues. You come into this orchard in, in some while and it starts burning. Uh, like this. Uh, but it looks amazing. I'm definitely going to play it. I, I think <laughs> I think it's really. Um, but I I guess like <laughs> it's their own. Uh, what I what, it, what seems cool about it, I think, is that there's um, in a lot of sort of terraforming games or games about um, I don't know extra planetary uh, experimentation. You very often play like a corporation. And then maybe um, there is corporate rivalry and there are different factions, right? Like maybe there is an eco faction and maybe there is like a, a, an industrialist faction. In fact, I think, um, is it uh, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, which I've never played, but it, that apparently has like really a lot of different cool factions. I think it's uh, the more factions, the better, because very often the if, if you get only one choice or if you get only two um, uh, there's just, I think it's a question that demands just so much nuance, right? Like, to what extent um, do we should, like, do we impact, do we and should we impact the planet? 
because uh, we, like we already do, right? And I, I'm not a sort of environmental purist. I don't believe that we should go back to sort of untouched nature at all. Like, first of all, we could never. Second of all, like the um, the 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 answer is to be is to live with, right? Uh, not sort of be in our own separate uh, bubbles. Um, so I'm actually really uh, when I don't know who asked it anymore, but like the person who asked about uh, what games do you, are you interested in playing? Having played so many of these terraforming games and extraplanetary colonization games, I'm actually really keen to play um, I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist because it's basically a dating sim, but like in an extraplanetary, uh, on another planet. And I'm so interested uh, to see how um, the sort of, this, how sort of the, the two genres mix, right? On the one hand, you have this slowly evolving um, uh, community, right? Uh, and on the other hand, you have these like uh, outlandish uh, uh, characters that are designed to be sort of desirable in a way, right? But very distinct, having their own different storylines. So, uh, and we, we, we talked about sort of the subversion of genres. I'm also really interested in when genres meet, right? You, you looked like you wanted to add something. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Any other recommendations? <laughs> this is rich. <clears throat> <laughs> so there is a Czech game uh, you probably know, which is Hrot. It hasn't come up yet. <laughs> so it's a game foremost, a bit like Quake 1. But uh, the way it portrays uh, Czech life in uh, communist times is just, you know, it definitely uh, reaches into the art arena. That was a recommendation, that's all. Is it like it's a, a little bit similar to my summer car or something or the, those like sorry too? those those games that are oh it's it is a shooter or is it like a twist to the well or it, uh, it is a shooter right did you say I mean, shooter? never mind i see it. yeah i see it now because <laughs> <laughs> the beginning looked like a... no very stylish and it has a lot of story uh, through the environment. Wow. <laughs> oh, Richard's good. <laughs> yes. Uh, we still have some time before uh, our reservation in the pub uh, it kicks off. So, still some questions. Oh, nice. Maybe we can also expand on a different crisis, although like it's one meta crisis probably, but not only environment, but also other ones. But uh -huh. please um, leave it. I have a question for Laura. Uh, you mentioned Gaia games, which I find kind of really interesting because you know, so far we've been talking a lot about, you know, games which are in their theme or, or in their mechanics kind of anthropocentric. And I'm wondering whether we could find a game which kind of focuses on like non-human actors, which where let's say that, you know, the procedurality of the environment is actually fairly advanced. And I'm kind of wondering whether anything, because Gaia like directly kind of references such a potential schema obviously being kind of like a, you know, inhuman system, earth system. And I'm wondering to what degree do we see climate modeling, ecological modeling, um, 
kind of being you know incorporated into games as a game mechanic because frostpunk seems to me okay i saw it like um uh, a temperature rising and so on but otherwise it seems to be pretty monolithic but i didn't actually play it but i'm wondering are there any games to your knowledge gaia games which might be more interesting in this regard um yeah that's kind of uh that was my initial interest in this genre as well right i was like okay how, how cool would it be to um uh like uh, for a game to have a sort of uh, a robust climate model right uh in all of the eco games i've played i feel like some of the the some of the most sort of robust kind of global models that you find are fate of the world which uh had consulting from um this like climate science dude in oxford uh, and uh, Sim Earth, right? Will Wright's Sim Earth from 1990, which had consultation from uh, James Lovelock himself. So those are the two games that I think have like the most robust uh, climate knowledge. Like, not that I would be super like a great uh, judge of that, by the way, since like, <laughs> I'm not a climate scientist. But um, but the so the the games that I looked at in my uh, dissertation chapter are all from. 2020 or 2021, and they all kind of are in conversation with games like Sim Earth, right? Um, but I, so the I went into those games thinking, oh, how cool is it going to be to see sort of the planet like kind of alive, right? Procedurally uh, 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 simulated such that it behaves of its own accord, that it has its own like quirks and whims and sort of that it is animated, right? Um, in the end, uh, these games are maybe not that sophisticated, I would say. So the, the planet is not alive procedurally. Uh, the planet is definitely sort of alive in other ways, right? There are other uh, strategies of representation that these games use to create a planet that feels like uh, and and uh, somebody that you have to interact with, right? Like a, uh, somebody that you interface with. Uh, for example, they use a lot of uh, uh, what are called the whole earth images. So pale, no, not pale blue dot, but like the blue marble or uh, earth rise. Like those are classic uh, whole earth images that, you know, even though they were the results of <laughs> blue marble, even though these images are the results of uh, the the, uh, the Cold War, um, there's a reason why these have become like symbols or emblems of um, the environmentalist movement, right? Because they they uh, tug, they have a sort of affect, affective power over us. And uh, my argument for this, these Gaia games is that in Gaia games, uh, three different sort of maps come together, right? There is the... Uh, the uh, the sort of the, the informational map, right, where you can see kind of what's happening. There is the, the territory that invites you to take action, right, to move upon from like one space to the next. And then there is the uh, um, the Gaia, the overview affect, as I call it in the dissertation, which is which is images like these, right, which are uh, affective and which kind of try and sort of. Uh, kind of um, interpolate you to, uh, to to sort of like treat this as a as an, an agent or like a, a being almost right if you google now i guess you won't find it that easy so but it's one of the images in my dissertation chapter is from sim earth with like the gaia window which just has like the face of <laughs> this is it's a really the really stupid image really image. Um, Okay, just Google Gaia window sim earth. Maybe you'll find it there. Um, yeah, but so in this new generation of Gaia games, uh, the games I looked up are called Before Before We Leave, Imagine Earth, and the Universe. In. If you're interested, you can uh, Google them. Um, no, you're never going to find it because it's, it, it's uh, just like a screenshot that I took from a from game. And I think it's... Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, you might find that. Oh, no. No, uh, it's in the paper copy, so you'll have to just uh, uh, dig through there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so long story short, I don't think that uh, these uh, new games have a very robust procedural model of the planet, but they have 
but they animate the planet in other ways, like narratively, visually, um, uh, exactly. affectively. Then actually, my, my question, my question, like it's like a remark. If we, uh, it's obvious why you and there's a, a lot of interesting points when looking at games like Frostpunk that are, I don't know, simulation based, if that's the right word, like strategy simulation, whatever. But when the question was actually about, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> nice. Uh, you can just, you can describe it. Uh, but uh, when the question was about um, like living with the planet or interfacing with the planet, uh, I don't know. Like game like Death Stranding comes kind of close. And do we like maybe that we don't need like simulation to do this emotional kind of simulated <laughs> experience? Like, yeah. I, mean, I would say no, I don't think, like, I don't yeah. need uh, a simulation to be really profound and robust and sophisticated to, uh, like, uh, yeah, you don't have to have that to uh, make a game about the environment or about the planet, right? Um, and in fact, like a lot of the other games that I talk about, so the only my first chapter is about these climate simulations. All of the other chapters are about different games that are do other stuff, right? Or maybe more narrative, or um, do these these quirky sort of subversive moves within genre. Um, yeah, and I think that's because. Uh, well, I mean, so my my PhD committee uh, thought that my first chapter was not the best chapter. So I will have to go back and revisit my whole point on simulation. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but that's just to say that uh, I agree with you. I think, you know, simula uh, simulations aren't everything. Like simulations also, it's it's about like what everything that's around it, I guess. You know, I mean, how do you, uh, how do you use the simulation? Like what's the kind of story that you're telling with the simulation? Um, yeah. I was always like, the, 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 the topic that rings rings uh, the bell uh, together with games like simulation is for example like Timothy Morton and their hyper objects where you were I don't know if you're all familiar but I think the definition by them is that these are like things like climate like they are so distributed in time and space so there is no single point where we can like look at them in their whole so maybe that's where games is like letting us uh, letting us manipulate like those very interconnected systems hands-on, even though in some abstracted uh, or cut way, might be interesting in their in their simulationness. But it's quite a challenge, right, to uh, to formulate um, a like a structural critique or um, or like to address these multiple crises crises if <laughs> you make this playable and 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 who is like who is the avatar that's like the big question right because it's not it's definitely like climate crisis not something that a single person uh, can can solve by um i don't know making a big um company explode or something like this of course this is much too complex but it's it, yeah probably but I'm I'm not sure. But but at the same time, if you if you try to to put it into into something playable, then of course often if it, it can become banal or it can it can it can be misleading because you you so easily you have then this um, this this um, the, the avatar with so much personal agency. Yes, it's not just not true in in, in real life, right? So yeah, uh, it's quite it's quite it's quite a tough uh, nut to. Uh, to crack, I guess, for game developers. <laughs> you can also go like really, which is really bare bones in the in the simulation uh, approach, which is, for example, this, like, from the perspective of certain games that it's called, it's probably not a game anymore, but who cares? Uh, it's a game that's called Sick Crisis Theory, which is by this, uh, I think, self-described leftist author, Colestia. They have. Uh, also a game about post-capitalist city, but also a game about CIA conspiracies, which are really cool topic, by the way. But they have also this interactive graph of Marxist economics, <laughs> and which I would like argue, I, I'm not a Marxist, uh, I don't, uh, uh, 
Prof uh, professors. Yeah, I'm not even a pseudo Marxist uh, <laughs> proficient enough to like comment on how accurate and accurate it is. But if I was like trying to explain somebody how like economy would work, I can imagine that maybe than just like slapping a sheet of a paper with a graph in front of them and being like, okay, so here is the primitive accumulation, blah blah blah. Then maybe like did they still like those complicated processes into a game like this and let them manipulate it. Maybe there is something there. I mean, this is just a very simple example. And Philip is actually much more Marxist <laughs> than me, so maybe he can comment as well. I'm, I'm sure a proper Marxist can can find some uh, some, yeah. some contradiction in this. <laughs> But, but I'm not sure if this is fun to play, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it takes five minutes to just like fiddle around. I, I, but yeah, sure. But also, maybe I have a question. But I'm taking too much space, maybe. But it's a question. I promise, it's not a comment. And it's a question to mostly, I think you, but not only you. But like the question of games as critical devices, as games as subversive devices, there have been some questions around games as tools for teaching, for example, and you know, uh, when I was thinking about it during this parallel, I think what maybe was kind of lost in here, or not lost, but maybe can be commented upon, is the context, context that we play the games in, and I don't mean like social context, which obviously is important, but also just the the, 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 the yeah, maybe yeah, the place uh, we play the games in, the um, uh, the, the, the words around the game, uh, whether we play them in a gallery or on Steam at home, whether we know they are from a famous Pseudomarxist guerrilla or that we just bought them randomly from a sale on a Humble Store, right? Uh, so maybe if we want games, because that's, the, that's like a lesson when somebody is saying something about games having a potential in, uh, in like traditional schools, like, even a game like Assassin's Creed has a potential in traditional schools when you frame it in the right way. Like, you can make a critical game out of uh, colonial fantasy of the first civilization when you frame it as a critical device to promote the colonialism itself, right? So maybe the context where we deploy games, how we present the games uh, that are supposed to be critical, let's say, is important. Yeah, I mean, probably the best example for what you're describing is the game uh, Monopoly, right? Like, the, yes. <laughs> I mean, this is a classic example, but being developed, I don't know if you know the story, but um, it was actually developed as a, 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 in the first place, being called the Landlord's Game, I think. Um, and it was actually uh, created by a, a woman um, who wanted to demonstrate um, how unfair the housing market is if it's in private hands. So basically, um, all players players lose besides one who accumulates everything um, and then yeah I don't know it, 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 it just really turned around uh, during the course of the history and now it's kind of it, it really became the opposite like teaching how, how great uh, it is to win against the others and, and to be the only monopolist left <laughs> this is really absurd so yeah definitely the, the context can, can really change whether something is a, a means of criticality or, or quite the opposite I, I guess right <laughs> and that's also where uh, the art it gets interesting because uh, later tomorrow tomorrow we will have a game by uh, a, a, a fine artist who's called uh, Jeremy Culliar and he does this very hallucinogenic like weird spaces with a lot of weird bodies and blah blah but he also presents them on Steam, like in traditional Steam spaces. And you can see that not all the uh, reviews there are from the people who landed on the page because they wanted to play a contemporary art game by an artist that is being like exhibited in galleries, right? There are just like people who saw uh, a cool stuff and wanted to try out. So maybe that's, there's also some version in, I don't know, yeah, in, in the context itself, if you know what I mean. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess this is still also the um, the potential that uh, that we see in games, right? To um, that it's just so fun to play, and that it's just so great that it will just um, bring about revolution and everything because it's just so um, such a wonderful game. But I think in the first place it has to work, and right, and and. So maybe all, all it takes for a socialist revolution is to have a socialist battle pass in Fortnite. I don't know. <laughs> 
Any questions since we are uh, approaching the final <laughs> moments, minutes, levels, cycles? Okay, I will play moderator once more. Uh, we had climate crisis. Uh, we, have, we talked a lot about climate crisis, but what? Okay, let's be pragmatic. Use of games in tackling all the different crises around us. Do you see? Just like be inspirational, critically. You mean, you mean what kind of crises are? Pick one. There are. Sorry. Pick anyone. Uh, Apart from climate. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know, democracy, totalitarianism. But which game? Well, I mean, Frostpunk does a bit of that, so. Apart from Frostpunk. <laughs> like any game that could be in our critical times, interesting from a sort of like pragmatic, looking at crisis differently, explaining the crisis, solving the crisis, useful. Well, I, I don't know about games which are kind of on market, but obviously there is, uh, for example, VR being uh, used to treat phobias, which definitely we could consider, you know, crises, um, various other, you know, types of anxieties and, and neuroticisms. So that's definitely, you know, one of the very interesting um, aspects where, like, but it's not a game, you know, it's like this virtual space. I think, I think this is where my presentation was kind of coming in, you know, this ability for... Um, for this transference between like the virtual self and the real self. And I think there's a lot in this kind of needy, you know, needy space in between. There's actually a lot of potential. Um, and, and yeah, like the treatment of phobia as being like one example. And I also heard it very interestingly, actually people who are uh, due to accidents and actually each other guys do, do, do working with this idea as well. But um, that uh, if they use VR to actually show people their legs moving, then their rehabilitation is like con conclusively um, better because, like, uh, yeah, they they it's again kind of like the rubber hand. You know, you see yourself doing something, even though it's not really you. It's not really a part of your body, but it does help to learn to walk, for example. And once again, yeah, I can look it up later, but I remember writing an article like two years ago, three years ago, about a game for the elderly people that really had quantitative, I mean, yeah, I know it sounds kind of like just throwing this part around, but yeah, it had like kind of, as far as I understood, kind of conclusive results for like maintaining their whatever mental uh, abilities, like fresh or like cognitive capabilities. Also, first-person shooters do uh, make us more <laughs> reactive to some visual stimuli. But yeah, there are definitely those cases, sure. But more of a political level. I, my question was really uh, directed to. Yes, I guess like, yeah. Hello, it's me again. <laughs> so, uh, GTA 5, I think, does a brilliant job of, you know, it's the whole game is satire. There are like, I don't know, 500 fake brands that are modeled on real life. It's a wonderful uh, cross section of, you know, consumerist, capitalist. I think LA, you know, uh, was built for cars, so it's a perfect match for the city. Uh, radio shows it has i think you know considering it's aimed at young people uh first uh, foremost i think it does a brilliant job of uh, conveying you know how certain things are related to each other so i think people young people actually walk away with you know a deeper understanding of the world around them i think it's really is there, I, uh, I don't know if you've seen that project really shows that i think the guy's called alan butler Yes. Uh, the, the project is called like Down and Out in Los Santos, mm -hmm. and it's like presented as a photography project, but it's all stills from the world of GTA V. But I agree with you, and I think it's extremely interesting that that's the game that gets the hardest time from 
for, for different reasons from often media commentators or whatever. So it's a in, really interesting example of that. I, I just wanted to ask something about when I came in, um, I just caught you talking about Monopoly, and it's quite interesting that, uh, Andre, your example was like uh, the reverse, because in Monopoly, it's like, if I've understood this right, what you were saying is it's designed to be anti-capitalist, it gets converted into yeah. a perfect commodity. There's Yeah, I mean, they have changed some things, I guess, um, yeah. also because it, it was originally developed by this, by this woman and then, yeah. I don't know, I think she sold the, um, uh, the, the rights on, on what she did to, to some publishers and they exactly. changed something. Yeah, yeah. If you look at it now, it's like Star Wars edition, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, so it's like, you know, a good example of how something uh, critical gets converted. It's capitalist realism, I guess, a perfect example yeah. of that. But actually, Andre's example is the reverse of that. Like, it, it begins as a game that's pro-civilization, but if you frame the teaching of it right, it becomes... The reverse. I just, I just thought it was quite interesting because you always hear it this way around, this yeah. kind of capitalist realism way around. But is there a capacity to do it the other way around and take the capitalist things and turn them against themselves, or are those attempts also kind of doomed in a similar way? I don't know. That's my question. Well, that's what you're doing, though. <laughs> kind of. I mean, we're trying, but I mean, um, at, if you look at what the what the modern communities would do to 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 a game, or how to turn uh, it, it into absurdity, or uh, open open up something that was completely not intended, or or turning the game mechanics into um, oblivion. I mean, this is just um, this is there's extreme creative power in it, and of course, I mean, is this still a capitalist product to some degree probably of course yes because um the, the developers um, um imply modding because they, they it, it will help the revenue but um to some degree also it become uh, it, it can definitely become something else at least i don't know yeah i was just about to add that that it's like it's basically like skyrim you know the most modding modded game in the world is still like pe many people buy it still and it has like i don't know five billion downloads of mods like in total that's in, absolutely insane but it's like because of that it's successful and it's obviously like many many interesting interventions there from mod modders but it's like it's already became become a like cheap labor force for video <laughs> games and it already became this commodity <laughs> already and it's like in in like within like i don't know eight years or something or 10 years or yeah Things change fast there, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to like briefly mention we also have these counter strategies uh, in games themselves, not without mods, like kind of a means of playing differently. I think Alexander Gal no Alexander Galloway. Is it Alexander Galloway? It's probably not Alexander Galloway. But there's this uh, term that's called counter gaming, which is like playing against the rules. It has like different definitions, but one of them is like right there. And there's a, it's a new pacifist, pacifist run in World of Warcraft, which doesn't seem like a particularly fun experience, but anyway, it's maybe a critique of the accumulation of the in-game that happens mostly by what is arguably genocide. So, uh, but yeah, that would be like one example of turning things around. But I don't know about any of, yeah, apart from the educational context, I'm thinking about any game that could be like taken, that would be like misunderstood for being, or misunderstood, like that started as a capitalist simulator and then turned into socialist critique, <laughs> Not like monopoly, but reverse, maybe, it, it's a challenge for sure. Well, there was that, I mean, I hope you've like, read the headlines for this, uh for this uh, news item, but I think with Anno, what's the new one, Anno 1800s? Uh, maybe, yeah. So apparently like socialism is too OP in the game. So lots of people complained, they were like, oh, I can't get the there were, um, so people complained that socialism is too overpowered in <laughs> Anno 1800. Um, so yeah, and I think is it, that's or is it the sci-fi, uh, the the one that's like futuristic, or is it in eighteen hundreds? I don't remember because in eighteen hundreds you have some socialism or like this anarchistic guy that like agitates your workers to 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 do some sort of inconvenient revolution. It's not really a revolution, but they just stop working and go on the streets, and then the police comes and is like, "Hey, you have to go back to work," and they're like, "I guess I do," and like it's all so friendly and weird. Like, <laughs> but I don't know if it's it might be in that. I, there's so many like DLCs, you know, that cost insane amount of money, and you can like there's probably a one 
Yeah, it could. I, I don't think it's the sci-fi one. It's definitely uh, like one of the recent ones, but it could very well be a, D, a DLC for sure. Yeah, uh, you and I couldn't afford the DLC oh. to play socialism. So. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing in terms of schedule? Well, it's love. <laughs> so we still have time for some more discussion. Or if we are too tired, are we tired? Yes, are we thirsty? They also have vegan hot dogs. I heard. So last call, I guess. So last call for the to the audience. No? Okay. Uh, so should I wrap up? Okay, so thank you so much for being with us until the evening. Uh, thank you to all our participants, uh, and yeah, if you haven't been here uh, in the uh, in the beginning, uh, we, the whole recording will be on the YouTube of other streams, so look it up there. We also put some links in the Frack Collective uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, before I invite you fine for one last time into the pub, I have to just mention we are not, uh, this is not the last day, we will have uh, tomorrow is the second day. So if you want to have some fun with us, uh, you can play League of Legends tournament with us. Uh, we will be forming our teams at 12 uh, p.m. I don't know, 12 a.m. I, I never know. I hate it. 12. Just 12. I'm going to be using 24-hour format. Uh, so please show up. But we will be kicking off actually with two presentations by Frog Collective and their uh, new design, a bonus level, but also by the first Czech Queer Collective, No Fun, which disclaimer I'm part of. And we will be just thinking out loud with you and with some of our projects about how queer games can work and how we can create games beyond representing LGBTQIA plus um, uh, identities. Uh, for those of you who will maybe, but I hope not, but maybe will lose in the tournament uh, or don't want to join, which I highly doubt, but if there is somebody like that, we will have group reading of John Bios. Uh, which will actually, which is actually a really cool uh, work, uh, book, Ideology in the Virtual City, where we will be having a uh, Czech and uh, English copies. Uh, the Czech will be very exclusive since it is yet to be released. And it's again, it's a book that there will be a lot of about GTA 5 as uh, the ideological mirror of our society and neoliberalism. We will have curated selection of games from uh, HIO, uh, so art games, uh, some uh, Tetra, Tech Base, uh, Doom and Mod, uh, some Bovio Live videos, uh, some Democratic Socialism simulators, and uh, much more. And we also have a special VR session by Victor uh, that starts at 1, so we both have four great VR guests, so please come, we will have also headsets with us, so we're happy to, to rent it too. And at the nine, 19, is it, no it's not 19, is it 19, 19 or oh, oh, I, 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 I can't, I can no longer pronounce numbers, 19. At 7 p.m. in the evening, we will have a uh, commented finals of the League of Legends. So even if you don't play, please come. It's going to be exciting. And now, last but not least, thank you again. And we will see each uh, see, see, we will gladly see you at Laika Bar just across the street from Avu, where we can continue our informal discussion. Thank you so much. And please give an applause to our very, uh, there's the word for English, I forgot, guests.